working. That seems to be... Well, the mic thing is uh, getting feedback. Well, everybody, welcome to the 10-year uh, anniversary stream. I mean, uh, I just got to say, it still blows my mind that we've been here for 10 years and we're still going. I mean, it doesn't really even feel like 10 years, but, you know, when I look back, I'm just like... Wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, April 3rd. Uh, the actual 10-year anniversary was actually yesterday, um, but I was busy with work. Uh, I even did some uh, rail fanning out on the uh, Keystone Corridor because Amtrak 130, the uh, Phase 2 Heritage Unit, the new one, <laughs> was uh, going down the Keystone on the Pennsylvanian. I hadn't seen it before, so I wanted to get it. Anywho... I see some people are even commenting on the beard. Yep, this has been a couple months progress, maybe like three or four months progress. Um, and I am not allowed to shave it if I wanted to because otherwise my girlfriend, Firewolf, would kill me. Oh, I'm not even joking about that. She she, she does not like it when I sh uh, trim any of my hair, or facial hair, whatever. <laughs> Uh, I wish, I wish I was making that up, but no, it's serious. <clears throat> and I just put that spammer, uh, in timeout. So, um, what we're going to do, if you guys have read the description, we are going to go on a little, uh, video watching trip, basically reacting to all my, you know, some of my old content and then working our way up to some of the present day stuff. I'm not sure how long I'm gonna keep this going. Now I'm not gonna be able to look at all the old videos because some of them do have copyrighted content in them music wise and uh, I don't wanna to have to deal with that. I mean, oh, it's a live stream, but it doesn't matter. I don't wanna deal with that. So without further ado, let me chain, uh, let me get rid of this image out of the way. And then we're on desktop now, and we are going to start going back in time. Oh, yeah, this this is what you guys heard at the beginning of the stream during the, uh, you know, wait, uh, the wait feed. Pretty good stuff. So let's just close that. And why don't we appropriately start with the very first video, the one that pretty much started it all. Now I'm hoping you guys can hear it on your end. No, you don't. Crap. I never get it right the first time. Let me see. If we already got ourselves a um, <clears throat> super chat from Fresno Subber. Thanks for the just under a dollar. It's coming through on my end, but like the um, for some reason the video isn't streaming the audio. I don't know why. Let me try that again. Oh, it was just very low in uh, volume. So I guess I gotta turn it up on my end. Not sure if you guys can hear that. You guys hear it? All right, good, 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 good. I'm actually gonna turn it down just a little bit more. And, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be good enough for now. Of course, it's in freaking vertical mode because, you know, I was using an old iPhone at the time. I think it was like a 3GS. The video and the audio are a bit wonky because I tried to upload it directly from my phone onto YouTube. And originally there was no audio, but I did a replay earlier this morning and it actually does have audio, surprisingly, now, even though it's glitched and all over the place yeah you can hear it cutting in and out but uh yeah this was the one that started it all it was just a simple growl test of one of the limerick power plant t128 sirens uh this was site 76 out of uh, 165 uh, they had just started disconnecting the thunderbolts back then which is the one you see on the left the one on the right is the T128. 
There you go, there's your growl. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this was pretty much a simple video that started it all. Um, this was just down the road from my house, actually, the siren. So, back then when I created the channel, I, I was really, really... Hold on a second. Robert Vance, TCIC TV... EFTBC Productions. Thanks for the five bucks. Gosh, that's a long name. <laughs> Will you do another one of these remastered train wreck documentaries? Absolutely. I've got a bunch of them planned. Um, the two that I have off the top of my head is Big Bayou and uh, the... What was the other one? Uh, yeah, Big Bayou and the Cajon Pass, the first one. So, um, yeah, this was pretty simply, you know, there's not much else to see in the, the rest of the video. This was pretty much how it all started. Um, I didn't know what the hell I was getting myself into. It was uploaded a day after the channel was, uh, you know, officially live. I was just some dumb kid, 12 years old at the time, with a phone uh, that was hoping to film stuff that people have probably never seen before in a uh, small part of southeast uh, south uh, montgomery county pennsylvania that nobody really cause nobody knows about my area where i live nobody does so um yeah it's kind of humbling to see such a simple video like that uh be the groundwork for uh what would eventually come now all these bad piggies videos these were oh my gosh there used to be this app or not app it was like this service that came with the uh bad piggies app and i think it also came with some of the other rovio games i forget what it was called but i used and abused that to try and put stuff on my channel as you can see they gained no traction i'm not even gonna bother watching any of them because they were just pretty stupid by nature but um you, you know you can see for yourself there was just a ton of them um, why don't we start going into some of my first rail fanning videos? Um, we'll start with this one. Hey, look, I was facing the she right comes. way. A bit loud on my end, so I'm just going to turn it down just a little bit. This is, I'm still, I can't believe I remember this is what Strasbourg look, uh, 90 looked like all those years ago. Because now she looks more like her 90s dress without that white stuff on the front the white paint on the smoke box of course I was doing this handheld so yeah wait 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 hold on I just noticed something did they I don't remember that signal being there did they did they replace that I could have sworn Hold on a second. Let me check another one of my videos. Um, I'm just going to duplicate the tab real quick and then just look up one of my my more recent Strasbourg videos. We'll just do the 611 one because, you know, that's the last time I was up there. Uh, there's one of mine in particular. I know, a bit of, a bit, oh, a bit zealous to try and look for one of my own. Uh, got another donation from uh, Joey the Cat. U.S. Class One. Uh, thanks for the two bucks. U.S. Class Ones are challenged Sodor's safety record. Indeed, they do. All right, uh, you know what? I'm just gonna do it the old fashioned way, 611. And then try and find one of the videos from, uh, kind of jumping ahead to 2019, but uh, trying to remember. Let's get to where we were departing. Oh yeah, they did replace the signal. 
Yeah, because they used to be that pedestal type here, and then now they replaced it with uh, a Penzi position signal like that. Because the other one's still there. You can see it right there. Huh. I never knew that. Jeez. <sighs> that just shows you how old the footage is. Even Strasburg changes after, you know, what was it, like... 10 years, I guess. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? Um, let's continue on. These videos here, these siren ones, like Monessen, if I ever pronounce that right, Edge Hill, which is actually not that far from me. These videos were probably the easiest to ever edit. All I really did was take a photo of said siren, made it with the audio of said siren on the Siren Archive, which was an old website that is... It's still up. It's just nobody really uh, updates it anymore. It hasn't been updated since 2006. And then I would just upload that as a video. It, they were just pretty basic, you know, back when I was still obsessed with sirens. Um, we're now continue on with one of my other rail fan videos. Oh, hello. Another donation from Robert. Will you experiment with filmography like your mother one day? Y'all like that very much. Not sure what you mean by that, but, uh, who knows? Let's see. Drysburg 90 arriving at Cherry Hill. Let's see how cringe this clip is. Oh. Step one to being a foamer. Scream every time the, uh, somebody blow, uh, train comes near you. <laughs> That's what every foamer does. They go like, woo, every time a train comes by or they whistle. It's so annoying. But then again, I used to do that, so who am I to complain? And yeah, waving at people as they go by. Of course, since it was on a phone, the hand would keep getting into the shot. But yeah, I still do that every time with like excursions. I'll just wave as the train, uh, as the train goes by, if it's a pasture train, of course. But... Obviously, I make sure the hand isn't in the front of the frickin' camera lens. Uh, I scream whenever I see something very rare. I mean, we all used to do that at some point. And then I just cut it off right as the tail end goes. Oh my gosh, these videos. Oh man, I used to see these all the time as a kid. The old stuff. Good memories, good memories. Um... Let's see, we'll also check out um, probably one of these Young Ones Siren parodies. Now the context behind those videos is there used to be a British program uh, from 1982 to 1984 that starred Rick Mail, rest in peace, as well as a bunch of other British stars at the time. And I wanted to, you know, bring light to the show and do like parodies of it using sirens. It was a dumb freaking idea. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but... A lot of the clips, you know, the context behind them, it still makes me laugh. Um, particularly uh, ones like this one right here. T-128 as a Rick. Neil the hippie. Uh, I love how incomplete the video, uh, the clips are, because the bomb's not even touching the ground. <laughs> and Thunderbolt, as the pe as the punk Vivian wants it to go off, so it's like the video itself is terrible, but the context behind the clip it still makes me laugh because I love the show. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. A great business to have in 1983. <laughs> Trying to bash it open with a hammer. <laughs> and then bending the freaking badly modeled sledgehammer. That actually happened in the episode, and I tried to model it in the parody because it was just so funny. Uh. It's terrible in a funny way, exactly. 
Exactly. And if she doesn't do something to help the kids by this afternoon, that show that that tells you right away it's a British show, not a uh, American one, even though it's got American sirens. Oh my gosh, what was I thinking back then? Um, let's see what else old video wise. I'm not gonna go after these ones because they're just way too long. I don't feel like sitting through them half an hour. Um, now videos like the Rail Fan Thriller. Oh, I have no idea why the hell I made that. And unfortunately, this video of Colbertdale, I can't wa uh, show you those because they have copyrighted music in them. Can't really show them. Um, I will, however, see if I can find a shorter but watchable um, old Rail Fan video. Uh, ooh, this one's a good one. So Amtrak train days, this used to be an event Amtrak would hold every national train day. Um, they would go to a, a certain location to show off their equipment, stuff like that. Uh, it seems seems to be more, uh, seems to make more con a better context if I just showed you parts of part one instead. But yeah, this was a fun event. This, on this year, this was 2015, they were hosting it in 30th Street uh, in downtown Philly on the lower level and they had all kinds of stuff on display it was it was such a surreal experience that i totally butchered when filming but it's something i'll never forget so we'll skip around and watch some bits and pieces of it hugs intro of course i was foaming over 406 because this was the first and only time I ever got to see this thing, even though it's not really an F40PH anymore, it's more just an NCPU with head end power. But just to see it, the thing, uh, just to see it in general was just such a surreal experience. I'm not sure what that, uh, that almost HVAC sound was. Yeah, I was just busy foaming over that thing, and then 642 was on the head end. And you basically would walk through the exhibit train first, going through the history of Amtrak. And the funny thing is, back when I used to rail fan at 30th Street a lot, a lot of people would foam like, oh, look at the phase three equipment in the yard. And I was and I was like, that's just the that's just the friggin' uh That's just the uh oh geez, I'm trying I'm almost forgetting. Uh Oh yeah, I was like, that's just the exhibit train. It's always there. I think it's still there in 30th Street right now, too. So yeah, you'd go through and it'd take you back to the history of a SEPTA, I mean, uh, Amtrak. And oh, by the way, I have see, I think, I don't know if that's 66 over there. Uh, uh, but I have seen 6920 NS, which is right here, and 42 I saw long ago, the Amtrak 42. I don't know if they're actually going to bring it back at all, but it'd be pretty nice to see again. To be fair, I would kill the F406. <laughs> vibe, man. Frickin' vibe. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a wit. The pointless arrow. That looks more like copper. All right, starting from the beginning, it's got 1970, Penn Central off there. Yeah, in the form of a metro liner. Used to be owned by the That's actually true. That's my favorite part of Amtrak. Just going through all the years. The Dash 8s, the Dash 840s, or whatever they're called. <laughs> the day one unit. Phase 3, oh my god. <laughs> I love that livery. That phase 3 that they had. Yeah, 2015. 
when this video was taken. They were they were still brand new back then. I don't know if that's an FL9. It looks like an E8. Nah, it's got to be an F uh, F unit. 42 is electrical problems. Last I heard, Amtrak decided to throw it in st storage. That makes sense. The rainbow trains. I'm not sure what scale that is. I think that's uh, uh, HO. I'm sure somebody in the comments will be able to, uh, or in the chat, in this case, will point that out. Yeah, there it is again. Skip around a little bit, because like I said, this video is over a half hour long. All the horns. I don't know if these are models or real, but, you know, they had them from all the different engines. Uh, and I think later on you even got to tour some of the equipment they had on display. Um, see if I can find that bit. That's O scale. Oh, it is? Hmm. Well, then again, I wouldn't know. And this is the coach itself. That's not coach. That's, that's a snack car, I think. Twenty-three oh five. That was my favorite of the toasters because it was the first one I rode behind and the one I saw the most often. Now, at the time, I had never ridden Amtrak in my entire life, so this was all new to me. In fact, I don't even t think I took a first Amtrak run until I think almost two, one or two years ago. Yeah, I know. I've been a rail fan for so long. And it took me so long to actually ride an Amtrak train. First time even sitting in one of these. I will admit those Amfleet cars are actually pretty cozy. Not gonna lie. Uh, that's one thing I Amtrak definitely gets right. It's those Amfleets. It's a good crapper, even though they're taped down. <laughs> Cafe. It's not dining, it's cafe. Yeah, see, there you go. I'm getting a little bit. And then go over into one of the view liners, I think. Yep. The guy I was with was actually my mom's uh, ex boyfriend who uh, passed away. He's dead now. Um, he was accompanying me for the trip. I know it sounds embarrassing to say, but, you know, back then. I was 15 years old. I wasn't trusted to go by myself. Yeah, we were both shocked that there was a literal shower on board. <laughs> but hey, you know, when you're traveling in luxury, you got to, you know, in the view liner and you're paying top dollar, you'd expect something like that. So, uh, yeah, not much else to see there. What I was pissed uh, about Amtrak train days that I missed, there was a bell duel between an NJT multi-level and the SEPTA uh, Comet cab car. Uh, we all know which one would have won the SEPTA one because it was mechanical versus an E-bell. But uh, now let's go over to part two to see some of the rail fanning. Because one thing, as, as much as I hate some of my old rail fanning videos... The thing I always love is seeing all those old sites you almost never, uh, you almost never get to see anymore. There she goes. And I think one of those sites is coming up right now. That's the old, that's the Atlantic City line. I was shocked I never got to see anything on the, uh, High Line over there, the CSX High Line there. Because usually there'd be at least one train up there. A lot of Comet 4s. At least I think they are. It's going to come up. It, they, they're definitely not that big anymore. Those uh, Atlantic City Line trains. They're actually pretty small. Yeah, there you go. There it is. ALP 45 DP. They do not use those things anymore. Uh, they had those... Then they had those X Amtrak P40s at least once or twice. I don't remember. Uh, I think I've seen one at least. And then um, even the PLC42s, which I've heard are junk. 
But nowadays, all you see on those trains are the GP40, PH, whatever they are. You know, the XCNJ stuff. And let me tell you, that is one hell of an upgrade. Because <laughs> the ALP45s are, from what I've been told by a lot of NJT rail fans, they are garbage. <laughs> because it's a dual mode engine, and usually with dual mode engines like that, there's probably a good chance it's going to be good at neither propulsion. I was foaming over an AEM-7 that it pulled into the platform. There it is right there. This was 914. Just skip to its departure. Now, at the time this was taped, those things were already starting to quickly... They were starting to become a rarity, um, so you weren't able to see them as much anymore. I think this must have been... Oh, and Heritage Diner, too. You don't see those anymore, either. <laughs> like I said, that's my one thing I like when watching some of these old rail fan videos. You get to see old sites you don't get to see anymore come back to life again. Of course... Of course, you could always recreate them in Train Z or something. Oh, there's another one. Out with the old, in with the new, quite literally. <laughs> this was rare, too. This was the only time I don't. I think anybody's gotten to a uh, rail fan on the lower level of 30th Street Station. And then look at that Heritage Coach, too. Oh, my gosh. That brings back so many memories. That's a regional. I don't know what they were doing with that heritage coach or heritage sleeper, whatever it is. But man, oh man. Oh my gosh, it's me without facial hair and twice as young. <laughs> right or no, wait, that wasn't the. That wasn't a regional, that was a Pennsylvanian. Because I remembered there was another site that was on this video that you don't see anymore. There it is. P40DC. Because usually, nowadays, it's all P42s. You never see the P40s down here anymore. I don't even think you can find them anymore. Even the ones that they reactivated. Well, yeah, because it's Pennsylvanian. There's no wires past Harrisburg. That shows you how sheltered I was as a rail fan. Getting spoilt by the uh, Northeast. But yeah, you ne I've never seen one of these ever since uh, 2015. It's absolutely insane. But, um... Yeah, holy cow. Just sites like this, you just don't see them anymore. We'll probably see if I can skip to his departure. Um, there it is. Right around there. Or no, that's just them coupling up. Uh, I'll find it. Hold on. There it is. Bit smoky. It's just so surreal, you know, just thinking this was eight years ago. Oh, we got a super chat. The Texas Hot Rail. Thanks for the five bucks. Hey, mind if I join you on Discord for the reactions, Trey? Um, I think I'm gonna keep off discord for now uh i'll probably chat with you later though if you want to um looking at the chat right now because i have my phone propped up over here so i can glance at the chat every so often uh any other memory uh, any other uh unusual catches that i got that day doesn't look like it just the view itself i think was unique 
Um, oh, oh, oh. There was this one clip um, when I was rail fanning here. Somehow I got to ground level at 30th Street right here. I have no idea how I did it. I don't know if it was trespassing. I, like, for the life of me, don't remember how I got down here. It's... I don't know if this is trespassing. I don't know if it wasn't. I, look for the life of me, don't know how I got down here, but it still offers a rather unique view coming out of the station here. If anybody has any idea, even though I'm a Philly native, technically, I don't know how I got down here. I seriously don't know. But, uh, pretty cool. The only vehicles in America that I know of that has buffers. It's so, it's still so weird. I don't know how I'm used to that. But, uh, nobody bugged us when we were down here. So, like I said, I don't know how I got down here. I wish I did, but I didn't. Oh, there's me again. Ugh. Hideous. And then what was the P42 on there that day? That was 201. Just an ordinary one. We got another super chat from uh, Robert Vance. Will you ever do another Engines of Septa? Eventually. I don't know when, but eventually. Alright, so I think we've had enough of uh, 30th Street for a while. Um, let's see, what else could we watch? Not that, because that's cringe. Even, you know, too cringe. Um, short rail fanning at Sharon Hill. All right, it's three minutes. Why not? Crappy old intro. Ah, Colbertdale. Skip it. And let me go back just a little bit. Yeah, there's 600. Sharon Hill, to be honest, is not an area you want to rail fan in. It's right by the, um... Museum? Two Mary Pair? No, it's one Mary Pair. Actually. Come on. Oh my gosh, look at how filthy that lens is. Oh yeah, it's a Silverliner 4. I haven't seen one of those in a hot minute. <laughs> Seeing them all over the place yet uh yesterday. That's the Philly sub I was hearing. It was not Amtrak, it was CSX. Amtrak. Amtrak. Is <laughs> that was my buddy uh Daniel. Um I don't know if he still has a channel. I was on Skype with him at the time. He was tracking uh, all the trains. And literally, as soon as I started recording, he said 141 had departed. And, well, there it is. <laughs> That's my dad and his girlfriend on the left there. The grumpy old Englishman. And then, forget. Are those the position signals? I don't know if they still had position signals back then. Uh, no, they're the color-coded ones, okay. I know, um, at, when this was filmed, the, uh, Harrisburg, uh, no, 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 the uh, Pittsburgh line still had the old color code, uh, the old, the old position signals, not these color-coded types, or not, not even those color-coded types, they have those stupid Vaders that nobody likes. And, uh, don't worry, I did not ignore that super chat from HR126, congratulations on 10 years. All right, thanks. And thank you for the five bucks. Is that things the fours will retire soon? Not for a while. Those cellas. This was back then when they still had all their mechanical bells. Oh, what year is it? Oh, it's 2015. 
Yep. That was the number on the on the last SL on there. <laughs> yeah, quite literally. So, all right, let's continue. I don't know what that noise was. <clears throat> oh, the old Doodlebug video. I got. I have the original clips without the music. Somebody asked if I could upload those. Um, I'll probably do that some sometime down the road. Uh oh. There's this video with the Septa Crossings. I have no idea why this guy gained so many views. But we'll check it out. Skip through the long intro. Oh! Oh! Oh, there's a memory you don't see anymore. When the cab cars still had the old uh, walkway still built on there before they... Put that metal slab on the front. Man, that really brings back memories. That shows you how dated the clips are, too. <laughs> now, I forget where this music track came from. Somebody uploaded, like, a series of synthesizer demos, and I got a hold of them, but I've since lost them. They were all really, really cool, though. This is uh, Main Street, I believe, or Beaver Street. Crossing really didn't change that much. There's the Septa train. It did not stop recording for whatever given reason. It's just an ordinary catch. You get this sight all the time. And a lot of these crossings down here, they still exist, but they're not all mechanical anymore. At the, at the time this was recorded, uh, I think it's uh, Main Street where I was. No, not, no, 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 no. Main Street's down here. Uh, this was 4th Street, I think. I don't know. I haven't been down here in a while. Um... But yeah, this crossing I was standing at was the only one in North Wales to be uh, e-belled. The rest were all mechanical, but now only this one still has all its mechanical bells on it, which is really a shame. All right, next crossing. We got a train. Got a super chat from Robert again. Ten years ago. Man, it's crazy to believe that you've been doing YouTube for that long. I still can't believe it either, buddy. Have just activated. This one right here should activate in a second. Here we go. I love that bell. That was an old WC Hayes on 3rd Street. That was probably the best out of the uh, crossings in town. And for you siren enthusiasts, there was, there's a Fidel Code Model 5 up there for North Penn Fire Company. It's still up there. I don't know if it's used. Yeah, right by the station. You can tell the video is also old because this isn't the camera I use right now is uh, twelve uh, is um, nineteen twenty by ten eighty, which is HD. The camera that I was using to film this, um, which is twelve eighty by seven twenty, that one was uh, yeah, a lot lower in quality, so it didn't look as good. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, you could definitely tell the quality back then. I hadn't used that camera for years, ever since a trip to Paoli, where it finally started to fall apart. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, not much else to say about that. Oh, Kyle Leonard's got a good question. What is the worst car you ever owned so far? Uh, probably the Mitsubishi that I own right now. That piece of junk. <laughs> At least the Hyundai I had had an excuse for being unreliable because, you know, it was old. Um, let's see. Not going to do the Hitler parody video. Um, oh, these videos. Oh, man. Another super chat by Samuel Van Handel. 
Thank you for the two bucks. Now, at the time when this was recorded, um, this was, uh, when was this? August 3rd, 2016. So three years. Um, I was using a very, very cheap camera. It was a Vivitar or Vivitard, as I like to call it, 786 HD. It was basically a GoPro clone. It was a GoPro knockoff, same case and everything. Um, I think I have the case of it. Yeah, here it is. It's laying on the ground here. Yeah, look. That looks exactly like a freaking GoPro case. Like, the buttons and everything. Broken as well. I did get it. I did use it recently, though, um, at a trip to Hershey. But the uh, seal eventually failed and water damaged the camera. But I saved all the footage on it. It was for that, that one ride where you get like a giant splash at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> I just had it. I originally had it strapped on my head for that. But then the park uh, officials wanted me to take it off. So I just used it for the, uh, you know, the splash barrier. Yeah, that was pretty short lived. Let's get on with the video. You'll tell how bad the quality is right away. At the time, one of the bridges was out because they were doing a lot of track work for the uh, Media Elwyn, which back when it was called the Media Elwyn, because now it's known as the Media uh, Wawa. I think I might still have the camera itself somewhere. Because that was the original case for it. In fact, let me actually go look for it. Be right back, just a little bit. Ugh. There it is. So this was the camera I was using back in 2016. This was the GoPro knockoff I was talking about. And uh, it doesn't work anymore as far as I know. Let me actually, yeah, yeah, it's water damage, it's done. <laughs> but. Where did I put that GoPro case? There it is. Or quote unquote GoPro case. You basically open this, slap it in, and there you go. You got your supposed GoPro. So, yeah. That was the camera I used back then, and. It's microphone quality was so bad, it would rival, like, cell phones from, like, 2005. So. <clears throat> You'll hear it in a little bit. Even bells would overpower this mic. It was so bad. The old signals. I think they replaced a lot of these as well, even though. Yeah, not the best. But it was all I had at the time, and it worked, so. Let's see if I can find a better example here. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? <laughs> oh, it's so bad. Yeah, if it works, it works. That's true. If it works, it works. So, not much else to see out of this video. Um, let's see. What we could do... Um, ooh see some clips out of this video when Levittown was being rebuilt looks a hell of a lot different now now 
there's one clip in particular I wanted to see out of this video. Besides that. You can see that station looks a hell of a lot different back then compared to today. And then you're going to see me foam on this catch right here. This is one of the CSAO locals. And yes, it did have 5286. I'm not sure where that thing went. I don't know if it's still around the area or if it's been sold or whatever. Yeah, we get it. Now shut up. Get your hand out of the shot, young me. Oh my gosh, I was foaming so much. I do like how they did the crossing sequence for the station, though. Oh man. Alright, let's skip over to another bit that also dates the video. The main reason I had come to Levittown. Uh... Another Conrail. Ugh, excuse me. Here it is. So when this was filmed, this was during an event I like to dub Septageddon. Because what happened was the Silverliner 5s had to be taken out of service due to cracks in the truck assembly. Um, so Septa had to lease... A Keystone set, you know, an Amtrak ACS-64, Am Fleets, and a cab car. An NJT set, which I mistakenly labeled as two in the Engine of the Septa Subliner 5 episode. Um, and uh, a Mark set of coach, two Mark coach sets, one with a cab car and one without. It was a weird time. It was a weird but fun time to rail fan Septa. So you could definitely tell it was out of the ordinary seeing an NJT train uh this far away from jersey well maybe not that bad but you know it certainly would cause confusion in trenton that's for darn sure i thought he was gonna skip the station but levittown's a major station even back then so obviously he had to stop because except the locals they'll skip all the way to one station and then go all, and then become a local the rest of the way. Ooh, I saw a good question from Frank Nangle. How do you make your train videos? I'm going to answer that in just a little bit, and you'll see why. Oh, I got blocked by a regional. It's blocked from seeing a regional, I meant. Yeah, foaming again. Shut up. <laughs> but even so, that was a cool sight. Oh, look, there's my old phone. That was my uh, S... That was when I started using Samsung, actually. S5 Active. I now use something different. I have it. Probably hiding under my junk somewhere. But I now use an S... Oh, no, I forgot. It's what I'm using for the uh, stream chat. Hey, hello, everybody. <laughs> But yeah, it's like an S20-ish something. Because that S5 eventually broke. So I, I went through a lot of phones and stuff when I was younger because I was such a klutz. Um, and then the next train in this clip. Um, oh, oh, you got to see this dumb. I don't know what I was thinking when I came up with this idea. Ground shot with a regional. What? what, what why? You know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking wind took it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I thought this would work. But, yeah. It was... The idea was good. The idea was good. Hold the camera steady. Jeez. Giving me motion sickness. 
Oh, it was in a cell of meat. Aw, oh, you really had to cock up in a cell of meat? Come on. Ugh. I do wish they went 150 through here. Oh, this. This was an oddity. Yep, ACS 64. An Amtrak one pulling mark cars with a SEPTA cab car. Where else in the world and what time of the year would you see this? Oh, that's right. They would do it again in uh, 2020, I think. No, 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 no. Either 2020 or 2021 when they were... Uh, when there was that uh, turnpike dispute. Whatever the hell that was. But, yeah. So that's enough of that. Let's move on to... Ooh, one of the old NS videos. This is when I started filming a little bit more often in my home area. Old Dash 9s, they're starting... It's funny how Dash 9s are becoming a rarity on NS now. That one's also a C6M now. And that thing doesn't exist anymore. That standard cab dash, it, dash 9. I think that was my first and last time seeing one of those things. A standard cab dash 9. Oh, man. The, the thing was, Norristown and Bridgeport, the area that I live in, more Norristown, they used to be like... The go-to places to rail thing. You had a lot more NS, a lot more variety in NS power. You had CSX on both sides of the river sometimes, mainly on the uh, Norristown side. You had Canadian Pacific going through Bridgeport via an old DNH contract. It was like, like I said, it was one of the go-to places to rail fan. But over time, NS gave CP the boot when Hunter Harrison wanted to move out of Philadelphia anyway. CSX didn't want to re did not want to renew their uh, con uh, trackage rights, but they would still use NS in, a, in an emergency. And of course, as we all know, NS threw away everything except mostly wide cab six axle GEs that nobody likes. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, back in those days. Norristown and Bridgeport were definitely one of the go to places to rail fan. I mean, you could still go there. It's just they're not as fun anymore. It's not a fun. It's not as fun of an area anymore. Um, oh, here. Speaking of the Septageddon uh, event, there's a video on all the uh, uh, lease sets. I'll just skip to the departures because I was just foaming and being an idiot uh, for most of the video. Um, here we go. They kept them all in suburban station. So this was the Keystone set. This ran as a local to Bryn Mawr, of all things. Really confu would really confuse a lot of uh, patrons, especially at Ardmore, thinking it was an Amtrak train. <laughs> oh, I can't believe SEPTA was able to get away with this during SEPTA Geddon. It was so freaking... It was a wacky time to rail fan SEPTA during SEPTA Geddon when all the fives were taken out of service. It was weird. He got stopped by a signal. Skip ahead to when he moves again. This was the NJT set. They ran this down the Trenton line, fittingly enough. Which again, would cause confusion at Trenton Station. Thinking it was an NJT train going to... Uh, I don't know what they call it, the NEC line. I don't know. I'm crap with NJT. I'm sheltered. Forty-six twenty-seven, which was the ALP forty-six that was leased. Up the local to Elwyn, and then the ACS six. The at the time there was only one set of coaches being used on uh, being leased by SEPTA at the time. They did get a second set 
And this set would run as the Wilmington, uh, Wilmington Newark Express, which would cause no confusion, but you'd be wondering why the heck you're seeing Mark and Maryland Commuter Service all the way up in freaking uh, Delaware. But yeah, it was a surreal time to rail fan back then. Oh yeah, local except Express the Bryn Mawr, local to Thorndale. Um, I know I explained it in the video, but um, uh, yeah, the engineer on this train was a complete douche. He said, "You can't be on here without SIP the permission." When in reality, I was in the right because you know I'm on, uh, I was on public property. You know the station platform. You're allowed to film wherever you want. It was just yeah. He was just he was just a douche. He just didn't like rail fans. All right. Um, aha. Now here's something that probably everybody's been waiting for me to get to. Um, but before I get to the first documentary, I want to give you a little bit of an interesting, uh, uh, bit of a um, little bit of an interesting uh, tidbit here. So this video, even though it has, remember earlier that um. The, uh, when I was rail finning at Levittown here with the crappy Vivitar, I also filmed this Conrail local, CSAL local, with my phone. And what I did was I carefully tried to match up the audio from the phone uh, angle to the Vivitar's angle to make it 100% sync so it would actually sound uh, decent. And uh, surprisingly, it turned out pretty well. As you can hear, it sounds pretty good in quality. When in reality, if we go back to that video, if I can find it. Um, where is it? There it is. Find the timestamp for it. Come on, where is it? It was when I was the other, on the other side of the plot. No, it wasn't when I was on the other side of the platform. There it is. In reality, that clip sounded like this. Come on, internet, buffer up. Thank you. Notice the difference? Out of all my editing experience, that was probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I even did it for the entire video for this right here. Um, and funny story, this was during sun. The, this video was taken during Sunday after, um, when uh, Amtrak used to run extra trains, lease equipment like arrows and such, uh, NJT arrows. Uh, yeah, and just it would just be a busy time to be on the corridor. Um, nowadays, they don't do that anymore. First, because of COVID, and now because Amtrak probably doesn't want to pay anybody. But um, one of the trains this year, this was, uh, I think it was 2016. Yeah, it was 2016. Uh, it had a Hippo on it, and a, uh, a Mark HHP8 leading on it. And I was hoping to get that, because that was going to be one of the first uh, holiday extras I'd see. But... When I was on my way to Wilmington via Norristown on SEPTA, they needed our set for the Wilmington line for what, who knows what. It was a set of fives, but then we had to transfer to Silverliner fours. And by the time we finally got out of thir uh, uh, I think it was um, Suburban sh uh, Station, we <laughs> we were over like 15, 20 minutes late. And what did I see go right by my window? The Holiday Extra with the hippo on it. I was living. I almost got thrown off the train because I was starting to flip out. Yeah, I was a younger, immature kid back then. But yeah, it was. I was pissed. But there was another one coming. Thank goodness. But did that one have a, um, a hippo on it? An HHP-8? Well, let's find out. I just first got to find the clip. But what I did with this video was I'd record the audio off my phone 
and then just dub it over in editing. Um, if I can find it. That's my friend Jeff, Septorel Fam 1000. I don't even know if he uploads anymore. Come on, where was it? Which clip was it? Yeah, that's how you could tell it was off mm. my phone. Eric. No, that's Septa, I think. Yeah, that's Septa. Where was it? God, let me check. Ah, you know what? I'm not gonna bother looking. Maybe. Ah, you know what? I'm not gonna bother looking. But it did not have a hippo on it. It had an A six sixty four and I responded going, Ah which is such a foamer thing to do, but oh well. Hit F talking. Let's go to what you all have been mainly coming for. Let's watch one of my old documentaries, starting with the first of them all. This was when people started to notice me on YouTube, I think. The old YouTube icon. This time we're going to sit through the whole thing because it's one of my documentaries. It's the first one. On January 4th, 1987, two trains collided head-on in Chase, Maryland on the Northeastern Corridor. No, it was a rear-end collision. The Northeastern Corridor, owned by Amtrak, is one of the busiest mainline train tracks in the world. Not only does it have to serve high-speed Amtrak passenger trains, traveling at 125 miles an hour, but slower freight trains, usually traveling between 25 and 50 miles an hour. Eh, give or take. I think that section of the corridor is actually 105 miles an hour. But give or take, yeah. Um, freight traffic-wise, it's, yeah, it is between like 25 to 60 miles an hour. Slower commuter trains also have to share this track. How did I get that Usually, wrong? Because I was a dumb... I didn't know what I was doing. Everything would run like clockwork, but on that day until 1993 was the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history. Oh, Tay the Rail fan, you live in Chase. How about that? Now, a lot of people got... I got a few angry comments for this part of the video where I said... You know, but on that day, until 1993, was the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history. Everybody thought that meant I said it was the worst Amtrak crash in Amtrak's history. No, I said up until 1993, though, because I said it so fast, people assumed I just said it was the worst uh, wreck in Amtrak's history. But yeah, that's NS63W, an empty stone run. That was a once-in-a-lifetime catch. Oh, a super chat from Robert again. We're going back to the past to the very first one. Indeed we are. Um, so anyway. <clears throat> yeah, I forget where I was going with this freaking ADD moment. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this catch, this video of uh, NS63W, this uh, stone run uh, from Wil Raybould, Delaware, up to uh, Birdsboro. Normally, this runs in the middle of the night when Amtrak's not running, but this day, back in 2015, I don't know what happened. Or actually, it might have been 2016. They ran it in the daylight, and I was, by chance, I was in Sharon Hill, and I had no idea it was coming. And it's, I've gotten a lot of comments asking, how the hell, you're so lucky to get that, Probably stuff like that. Time. Back in the day, it must have been a little bit more common, but nowadays, oh, no, 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 Amtrak no like daylight freight that's actually why believe it or not amtrak uh no conrail ended electric freight operations even though electric freight uh freight service was you know ahead of its time back then but because amtrak complained Conrail decided to hell with it and went back to regular diesel operations what is add attention PM, deficit Eastern disorder Daylight time amtrak train 94 the colonial was departing washington's union station let me actually hold on. I wonder if you guys can act. I'm just hoping you guys can hear this. I'm just going to listen to it on my phone here. Of course, the stream's delayed. Oh, yeah, you guys can hear it. 
Just wanted to make sure. All right. Train consisted of 16 coaches and two newer locomotives, AEM-7900, the prototype, and AEM-7903, which was leading. That's correct. These two were the first to be built for Amtrak in the early 80s, replacing their aging GG-1 fleet. They were destined to do 125 miles an hour. That's, that is their top speed. The train speed. consisted of passengers returning home from the holidays or students ready for the second semester in school. The train's next stop was Wilmington, Delaware before reaching its destination, Boston South Station. However, it would never reach Wilmington, Delaware. I have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hate Meanwhile, Trains. That's at true. Yard, east of Baltimore. Ooh, how long did it take to make this documentary? Um, I had started, uh, the, I had the idea back in like September and then I started producing it uh, between November and December, but I didn't officially release it until January 4th, 2017. Three Conrail GE B367s were beginning to leave light with no- Wait, wait a minute. I, I know I keep pausing, but I just realized, did I make the same mistake that I did in the remaster? Because I should have said B36-7s, because that's how everybody says it, not B36-7. Meanwhile, at Bayview Yard, east of Baltimore, three Conrail GE B-36-7s... I did! To leave light with no oh my gosh. Yard in I never learned. Ricky Lynn Gates was the engineer, and Edward Cromwell was the brake man. They had forgotten to do a series of cab signal tests in their lead engine 5044. Someone had also removed one of the light bulbs for the Pennsylvania Railroad-style cab signals. Alright, pause. This NTSB photo, it really perplexed me back in the day because I was like, where's the cab signals? But then I put two and two together. They must, uh, they removed the housing that would show all the cab signal aspects. And as you can see right here, one of the bulbs is missing. So they weren't lying when they said one of the bulbs for the Pennsylvania Rose style cab signals was missing. And then in the remastered uh, video, um, there was the clip where Rick Lynn Gates said he didn't know where the whistle, you know, the alert whistle was. I think it's somewhere down here. This pipe seems, uh, uh, this seems like it. I'm not sure, but there you go. Interesting little fact Even there. Even worse, an alarm that would alert the crew they had passed at a stop signal was silenced with duct tape. And if that wasn't enough, the crew were smoking marijuana joints. People tend to think marijuana has little to no effect. However, it can mess with your brain chemistry causing a lack of focus and forgetfulness. It can prove deadly on the job, especially on railroading, where you can miss a signal. Gosh, the sound design was bad. The Conrails were traveling at approximately 60 ah, miles Thomas an hour music. approaching gunpow interlock. That's kind of a uh, thing everybody Rides mocks me for in my videos. Only, so the I don't reuse them as much anymore. Stopped at a signal, only to rejoin the line again when the tracks were clear. Just gonna lower the volume just a little bit on my end. end. Gates passed many signals, including a stop one, warning him not to switch to another set of tracks. Prom now, if it, responsible for now, if it sounds like I'm going fast through my narration, there's actually a really good reason for that. When I was making these videos uh, back then, I was using not Adobe, which is what I use now. I was using freaking uh, Windows Live Movie Maker, and I was trying to time my narration uh, with... All the cuts I had previously set up in the video um, because back then I would uh, put the video together first and then record the narration uh, after putting all the photos and stuff together which was um, unfortunately you were forced to do that with Adobe uh, not Adobe uh, Movie Maker nowadays with Adobe what I do is I'll write the script first narrate it and then do the editing, photo and video, timing, blah, 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 after I've already done the narration, um, which, trust me, is a hell of a lot better. But since I was using Movie Maker at the time, I was forced to rush through some of my lines sometimes in order to time them correctly. It was not, it was, it was not a good way to make videos. Pulling out these signals if Gates missed them, but failed to do so. Finally, Gates applied the brakes. Realizing he did not have a clear set of tracks ahead. However, because not of the exactly. Conrails, they overshot the signal 
and were sitting on the main line and the same track the Colonial was roaring down on. Yeah, 8 bit nerds, sometimes they do. Sometimes it's just immature and insulting. And emergency brakes, hoping to avoid a collision. I regret that. And gosh, but this simulation. I hate this simulation, okay? Because it is very, very inaccurate to what actually happened. I mean, yeah, you see 903, which is right here, get thrown to the tracks. But you also see what looks like the middle engine getting split. Not to mention it's facing the wrong way. Because you can see all uh, these two engines are facing forward and this one's backward. It was actually, this one was facing backward, not forward like 5044 was. And they look like freaking... Uh, rejected U twenty five Bs in Southern Pacific colors. Why the emergency brakes, hoping to avoid a collision, but it was too late. The Amtrak slammed into the Conrails. But this was from this was an NTSB animation, though I think on what they think the an uh, crash, how the crash took place. Actually, it looked more like NS units. <laughs> After the crash, silence covered the tracks. Hey, that rhymes, sort of. <laughs> the locomotives lied smoldering, and pasture cars were crushed. The rear diesel, 5045. I do love, I do love the music. The I do love the music in this uh, part of the video. middle engine, 5052, suffered severe cab and nose damage. 5044 suffered little damage. Mm -hmm. Cromwell was injured in the collision. Gates was uninjured. However, in the Amtrak train, there was less luck. Jerome Evans was instantly killed in the collision. 903 was thrown to the west side of the tracks among some trees. Now, something I did like about Movie Maker is some, uh, one of the, uh, settings you could do with you know the photos is add a zoom effect and it's all pre-done it'll do it it'll go forward it'll go backward it'll pan to the left right it would do it automatically at a set speed depending on how excuse me the uh how long you set it to be in the editing process and that's something i do miss you know because all you had to do was choose which uh, whatever effect you wanted and then boom you were done with adobe you have to set up your keyframes and then move the object across and then you'll have your panning effect and you have to time it correctly as well which is a lot more complex but hey beggars can't be choosers did the remaster was crushed by the take long the remaster of this documentary take longer apps up freaking lootly collision was like 300 tons of tnt going off Enough to level a city block. The remaster was a lot more complex, too. Within minutes, rescuers and medics arrived on the scene. They were overwhelmed by the scene of destruction. Yeah, no kidding. Inside the mangled am plates, they heard people screaming and pleading to be saved. Oh, yeah. But their tools, such as the jaws of life used in automobile accidents, were simply useless against the mangled train cars. Well, yeah, because it's steel, not metal. Using ladders, airbags, and ropes, or whatever else they had at the scene, they worked feverishly, even into the night, to save the last victims. A total of 16 people lost their lives. Rushing through again. Wasn't Jerome speeding? Yes, he was, but I did not mention that was one of the major points I did not list in this video that I mentioned in the remaster. The accident, much was to follow. Gates and Cromwell deny the fact they were smoking marijuana, but drug tests showed positive. Gates even claimed that the signals came too late to warn him, but investigators knew that just wasn't true. Another thing is, just like I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of other a factors to the accident that I listed in the remaster that weren't present in this one. The speeding was one of them, but in this case, I focused more on, obviously, you know, um, Gates and his marijuana. But I also focused on other things, you know, like, you know, the speeding, the, um, the signal color, even, of all things. That's what I like to try and do with my videos, is look at every different aspect uh, that led to the disaster. 
Eventually, Gates was charged with manslaughter by locomotive and sentenced to five years in prison. Why was the mic so bad in these old ones? Well, that's because I was using junk mics. In fact, one of them, which is... No, that's an Xbox headphone, sorry. Um... But I used to also use the Cyber Acoustics headset that was USB. That thing had really atrocious uh, audio quality. I for I think what I was using for this was my phone. Or no, 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 no. It was probably the computer stock mic. Under Maryland law, a locomotive is a motor vehicle. And it was one of the first convictions of a locomotive engineer in Maryland. In fact, was completely destroyed and was the mic I use now. Was eventually re is this little guy. This is the mic that I use nowadays. Um, it's the let's see, Razer Siren X. Oops, just took it apart. Um, I got this thing at um, Micro Center. I would have been using it now, but the problem is uh, my computer only has one audio cable, and this thing uh, plugs in as like a microphone. So I, when I'm using that mic, I can't hear anything coming out of the computer, which is really annoying. It also has a USB cable that has to be plugged into it. So at the moment, I'm just using the uh, computer microphone, which is good enough. It's just quiet. This thing, though, is a lot more direct, and it works pretty well. Um, I do have to have a pop shield filter, which is right out of the storage bin here. It's caught on some wires. I'd have to use this thing, which I periodically take off my uh, desk sometimes to make room for my big elbows and stuff. <laughs> but yeah. Back in there. Paired and put back into service. The same happened with 5044. I didn't go into history about what happened to them after That's Conrail, the though. M7s, both were a total loss. Oh, come on. They're just pieces of metal. So don't get emotional over them. After the accident, federal legislation now requires random drug and alcohol testing on safety-related positions. This includes railway engineers. The accident also paved the way for automatic train braking devices such as positive train control, now installed on hundreds of lines, including the Northeast Corridor. I wouldn't say this accident paved the way for PTC, the but long, the idea was there. And the also, train. one thing I hate about my old videos is how I promoted PTC, like, oh, PTC could have prevented this, could have prevented that, to the point it's become a meme associated with me. I have since learned that PTC, it sucks, to be honest with you. It's, it breaks more than it works. I'll just put it that way. Until in recent times, been replaced by the new ACS-64. However, the memories and experiences of true hell from survivors and rescuers will stay with them for life. Many families that lost their loved ones on the train never rode a train again. Now that's something I didn't put in the remaster, but it is Ten true. Later, I read somewhere. Schools theater in Owings Mill Whatever Mill happened to Cromwell, to honor the that is something I forgot to mention in both this and the remaster. He was basically immune to all charges. Uh, like, he was still charged for the uh, for uh, the manslaughter, but he was going uh, he was gonna have a sentence commuted if he testified against Bill Gates, basically stabbing him in the back, and that's exactly what he did. He testified against Gates, Gates took the fall, and Cromwell basically mostly got away scot-free. He still lost his job, but it's really scummy and ambiguous. For those who like... Oh, I got a uh, donation from For Those Who Like Trains. Uh, that should pop up on uh, uh, Super Chat eventually. She was about to enroll into Princeton University to study astrophysics until the accident. Farewell, series. And there it goes. 
First ever donation. Anyways, congrats for making it to 10 years and one day. <laughs> exactly. It's been 30 years since the crash, and thanks to new railroad regulations and positive train control, the rails are safe as I wouldn't say because of positive train control. I wouldn't say it's because of positive train control at all. And yes, I did get it from a Lancaster Dispatcher article. Nowadays, I use NTSB or any other federal law uh, reports. Another super chat. Robert Vance again. Wow. 20 bucks. Don't blow it. Don't do drugs. If you're doing it, stop it. Get some help. Wise words. Um, did get Bill Gates get removed off of Conrail after his jail life? Oh, he got, oh, he got sacked even before jail time. Um, so, yes. <laughs> um, now let's see, what else could we watch? Uh, not one of my Q&A response videos, because they suck. Uh, let's see. I could do one of these Thomas and Friends narrations, Thunder narrates. I did the Duck and Diesel trilogy, but wait, why is there only two of them? There were three actually. Yeah, there was Pop Goes the Diesel, then Diesel's Devious Deed. Where did the other one go? Is it because of that made for kids crap? I don't know. But yeah, I could show them, but Mattel will be all over my back end for copyright. But to put it simply, I just narrated the episodes the way, um, you know, in my style. They were pretty fun. I might do the, one of those again. I don't know. Now let's go from the first documentary to the first engine of SEPTA. And boy, this video's, uh, it's bad. It's really bad. I'm not even going to lie. It is bad. And this stream will be zapped in an incident. You said it, Jessica. This intro is way too long. Welcome to another new series called Engines of now this, I remember, was taken off my phone. And it sounds like it's... If the audio sounds like it's off-center, that's because it is. So this became a theme in some of my Engines of Septa episodes where I'd use Windows remixes. That is not a Pioneer 3 nor a Civil Liner 1. That is a freaking Bud RDC 1 modeled after a Pioneer 3. Still looks cool though. That's a Pioneer 3. That's actually true. I've been there before. Which is currently located outside the Hanover Meat Institute in Philly, as well as the famed famous Pioneer Ejector, which was also If you also notice, I sometimes would study a lot in uh stutter a lot in some of my narrations, like going uh or uh mm, or int or uh because I was just so freaking dumb. Oh, you're missing a window right there. <laughs> Why does the audio sound so quiet? That's because it is. This might deserve the remaster treatment as well at some point. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, it needs it. Badly. <laughs> Unfortunately, these were marked 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that still makes me laugh. Oh, like any modern day airliner? Random Donald and Douglas theme goes here. The Pennsylvania Railroad's increasingly antique MP54 suburban MU cars prompted the railroad to order six Pioneer 3 MUs from Bud in 1958. Measuring roughly 85 feet in length and 10 feet in width, the Pioneer 3 coach was. When will I end the live stream? I don't know. Used by the Pennsylvania Railroad for its premiere in New York City to Washington, D.C. area and New York City to Chicago services. Sitting on the Pioneer 3 was in two rows of 25 in a 3x2 configuration. I think that's a little more comfortable. Scotland forever! The 3 was capable of running as a single <laughs> train, or it could be paired up with other cars. Six, uh, six was the limit. Well, yeah, because there were only were six built, you donut. 100 miles an hour, but in actual operations, it, no, it ran no faster than 80 to 85 miles an hour. Its knuckle-shaped tight-lock couplers, identical to those found This is also why um, the Pioneer 3s didn't last that long in SEPTA, because they all had the WAPCO-style coupling, uh, which was a lot different. So you couldn't hook... Uh, even though you could hook up a Soulliner 4 to, like, a 5 or a 2 to a 3 or, like, a 2 to a 4, you couldn't really... Uh, you could still... You couldn't MU it correctly, or at least for the 5s to the 4s. But with Pioneer 3s, you couldn't do any of that. You couldn't even MU them or couple them up in general, so. The original numbers were 150 to 155, with the even numbered cars having. I post the numbers of the originals, and yet the photo is the renumbers. Ugh. Fabricated truck frames and disc brakes, while the odd number cars had the casting of truck frames and tread brakes. A donation from STH10. Thank you for the nine bucks. Message retracted. What was your message? There's also another one from HR126. Okay, that I have to agree. There we go. HR126. Thank you for the five bucks. It's funny to see you being like, uh, in your old videos. No, not really. It makes me sound stupid. I wonder where this was taken, actually. This location doesn't seem familiar to me. Is it Overbrook? Aeoli, I recognize that. Okay, for the Amfleet bit, that's correct. But Amtrak did not buy the Metroliners. That was the Penzi, and later Penn Central. Not Amtrak. Get it right. Also Dumb younger me. The Pioneer 3 cars uses a slightly different right angle gearbox adapted from the very successful Bud built BTC M3 car. I don't know if that's actually an M3. traction motors at a right angle to the axle instead of the more common lateral placement. The need for a larger traction motor. Yeah, you can see right here, perfect example. There's the knuckle coupling on the Pioneer 3. And there's the Wabco coupling on the Silverliner 2s or 3s or whatever. That, yeah, that's a 2. That's been used ever since then. Up the, even the 5s. The 5s have the exact same coupling here. So. For a more traditional layout in the Silverliner 2 design, which we'll talk about later. Gosh darn, you're harsh. No, not really. You really think this is quality? This is cringe. It doesn't look that different. Shaft motor controllers, which provided for smooth acceleration. No dynamic brake system, however, was fitted. And yeah, because they weren't invented in the 50s, donut. 
thin stainless steel car body and other elements of the Pioneer 3 redesign, combined with the lightness of the traction components, resulted in the Pioneer 3 cars being the lightest all-metal electric multiple unit railroad cars ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I gotta pause it right there. Yes, that was a SEPTA bus that was in the uh, audio recording. Back then, I used to live off of Egypt Road in Troop, uh, in uh, West Norton. And there, not only was there a lot of traffic, those old SEPTA buses, uh, the flyers, I think they're called. I don't know. Bus people would know that. Those things were freaking loud. You'd hear one from like the, uh, more than five blocks away. They were freaking the loudest vehicles on the road it was like what the hell states although the pioneer three car was advanced for its time thankfully the road i live on now there's like nobody out here motors, a low capacity main transformer and all and an already stream of available gg1 engines with their locomotive hall coaches this what could be better than g uh, than gg1s long distance pasture service. can't go wrong with them however there was hope in 1963, now that is definitely the high line. The Philadelphia area, the Pennsylvania Railroad contracted with the Bud Company to build a more no muffler, I guess. What muffler? Using the Pioneer 3 as a model, Silver Liner 3s. Silver cars, as the stainless steel MU coaches were called, differed greatly from the Pioneers. They all had fabricated trucks with air springs, disc brakes, more powerful traction. Disc brakes? Where are the disc brakes? No, I seriously gotta ask this. In the old photos you see of Silver Liner 2s and 3s, they show disc brakes, but then when you look at them today, they don't have them. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, look. There's the Silver Liner 2s with disc brakes there. Oh, super chat. Ugh. Excuse me. Damio C, thanks for the five bucks. What is one subject you refuse to cover on the train act? It's the X years later series. I don't know. I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, I'm a little hesitant on the Mary J. Wontijla incident, but who knows? We'll see. Um, but yeah, look at this. Those are the uh, those are the Soulwinder twos with disc brakes, as I mentioned earlier. But then when you look at them later on in their career. I can find a good shot of them on the side that are not in model form. Yeah, look. There's no more disc brakes. What happened to the disc brakes? When was that done? I seriously don't know. That is so weird. Alright, back to the video. Oh, they had knuckle style couplings too at one point well, unless that's an adapter this is way too and over my head There you go, there's the subliner threes again. Now, what about that demonstration coach we mentioned earlier? Okay, this bit was actually pretty fun to put together, the music and talking about it in general, because I think nobody knew about this part of the Pioneer Threes. I mean I went a little too into detail about it when it has nothing to do with SEPTA. But I really wanted to talk about the history of it, which I love. This was such a cool uh, topic to look up when I was uh, doing the video. Ugh, critical pass. The kind of ser uh, vi media service where you have to pay to use public domain footage. Gross. Is that a butter DC? Oh look, they moved the horn from here to here. Into a hybrid turbo electric rail car, replacing the mechanical drive with an electrical generator. 
which provided over 4,150 horsepower. Reclassified again as DT2, the coach was intended to test gas turbine railcar operation into the confines of New York, Pennsylvania station, and therefore was given the capability to draw power from the 700 volts DC third rail. DT2 was also notable for being There you go. There's those disc brakes again. So cool. During the delivery of the Silverliner 4s between 1974 and 1975, the cars were renumbered between 244 to 200. I got it right this time. I could not find a photo of 249 being wrecked. Containing both the new cars and the existing newer cars. There was another loud car in the video, in the video, not in real life. Hello, just peeking out the corner there. Sorry. There was really no reason to keep them. Came with the spring timetable change on April 1st, 1990, due to requirement by Amtrak that all locomotives and self-propelled rail cars operating on the NEC be equipped with a new type of train control, which was the result of the 1987. I referenced that incident way too much in my videos. Until 2000, the cars were kept but it was a significant incident. Decided to dispose of the fleet due to Caleb, that is right, because those were the old Redding numbers and the lack of before they started rebuilding and renumbering them. That's actually what I was told by a Strasbourg employee. Cars could not show their full potential, but it's gratifying to know that without these cars, the Silverliner family we know today wouldn't have known to exist. And it's also gratifying to know that with I just realized the Pioneer 3s had also had this I guess air filter system on the side. God, I don't remember the 2s or 3s having those. Huh. Learn something new every day. That's pretty much it for this video though. Um, let's continue on in the history. Uh, ah, uh, yes, let's do, uh, some of our more famous videos. I, let, let's see, I want to do either this one or that one, or maybe this one. Mm, let's let the chat decide, should we? React to the Crazy Eights video, the original Cajon Pass one, or 188. Which one would you guys like to see? Let's have the audience engage this time. I don't know if the chat's delayed or anything. Crazy, we got one vote for Crazy Eights from that one guy. One vote for El Cajon Pass. Another vote for Crazy Eights. Oh, we're Barnes. Cannon pass. <laughs> so that's two for crazy eights. Wow, getting a bunch all at once. Um, so far, it is between Cajon Pass or one e or, or uh, crazy eights. Getting some votes for one eighty eight though. Load your red, please do not spam. Jeez, it's really, I saw a lot of, of almost equal numbers between 88 and Cajon. Um, but I'm seeing Cajon a lot more, so we'll do Cajon then. Push it all the way to the beginning. El Cajon Pass. 
one of the most dangerous and infamous mountain passes in the United States. Located the track the at the beginning of this video is copyrighted, is but steep, somehow I haven't been caught with it yet. It's not only tough to climb, but it's also hard to roll down without going too fast. It's also the site of not one, not two, but three runaway trains. This is the story of the first one, where it all began. It's not El Cajon, by the way, it is just Cajon. I got a lot of comments for that one. On May 12, 1989, in the early morning, Southern Pacific 7551 East was making its way towards the grade. The train consisted of 69 hoppers loaded with trona, a non-marine evaporative material mined as a source of sodium carbonate and sometimes used in fertilizer. It was hauled by a total of six locomotives, four leaders, and two helpers. Was it six? On the head end was SD40T-2-8278, SD45R's 7551, and 7549. Fun fact, um, I was watching this video, this documentary on SPSF and why it failed. 7551 was one of the very first Southern Pacific units to get the Kodachrome livery. Not really uh, hating on the video. I should have mentioned that in this version. I'll probably mention it in the remaster, but yeah. 7551 was one of the first ones to get this livery. And to be honest, it's actually one of my favorite liveries. SD45R's 7551 and 7549, and an SD45T-2 9340. On the helper end was SD40T-2 8317, and SD-45R 7443. The crew called in to handle this train were 33-year-old engineer Frank Holland, 35-year-old conductor Everett Crown, both in the lead unit, 43-year-old brakeman Alan Reese, who was in the third unit, 42 Ooh, look at that snooty nose. Didn't know they had snoot nose tunnel. Oh, were the tunnel Hill, loaders uh, snoot noses? Brakeman Robert mm, Waterford, who, knows? who were both in the helper unit, 7443. They depart Mojave Yard early in the morning, heading for West Colton Terminal in California, where another train will take it down to South America. A little after 7 a.m., they reach the grade. Before they go, though, they test their brakes numerous times. Nothing seemed wrong, so they head off towards the grade. As they go down, Frank Holland... I love this clip. Brakes it's very scarily the accurate, to the consist... The this video, this clip right here is probably the most, uh, the closest I've ever seen the consist of, uh, 7551 East when it ran away down the grade, right down to the Kodachrome unit, second, uh, in the consist. And this was filmed in 1986. Or no, 19, yeah, I think it was 1986, quite a few years Speed before the, the incident. Grade, after all, is or was it 88? I can't remember. Side, but it was still pretty cool. Times. Except it was a so manifest. The helps slow the train down. Still, they apply their air brakes to hold it at a constant 25 miles an hour. That's exactly where Holland wants it, since that's a safe speed. But then something odd happens. Despite the air brakes, Brakeman Crown notices that the train is That'd be creepy if that's 7551 in that hour. video. Slightly speeding, but then it creeps up faster. Runaway train, uh, runaway theme cue here. 50, even 65. Sped up video point, clip. They try and throw it into emergency. Which kind of works, but it's not enough. The brakes begin to burn up, and the train begins to fly down the hill as fast as 90 miles an hour. Way too fast. At this point, the engineer wasn't even in control anymore. He and the rest of his crewmen became passengers, and gravity has hijacked the controls. Oh, that's so bad, the narration. The West Terminal, informing them about their problem. Then... Frank remembers that there's a set of houses at San Bernardino, right beside a curve. It was right there that the crew lost all hope. Jeez. Locomotives jump the tracks and the hoppers tumble down behind, flying through the houses like nothing. 
The Trona spills everywhere, covering what wasn't crushed, like a sandstorm had just went by. Literally every car and every engine jumped the track. People were still having their breakfast or taking a shower when this rude awakening came through their neighborhood. Okay, calm down. When the dust Relax. Settled, the site was a complete mess. People feared something like this would happen, and now that nightmare was reality. Some people were even buried in what was once their homes. Even a I still have to ask, though, you know, a little bit of a side rant. Who the hell thought it was a good idea to put a housing development at the bottom of a steep grade on a sharp curve? Like, are you just asking for trouble with how close those houses are? Even I think that's too close. The swimming pool know. was no match for the train. Well, of course the swimming pool is not going to be a match for a freaking... 7,000 ton train, you donut. The lead engines that suffered the worst damage lay upside down or on their sides, still smoldering. You can see parts of 7551 there. The two helpers were mostly upright from the crash. Eh, slight rear end damage. Frank Holland amazingly climbs out of his crushed lead unit, but is badly injured with a punctured lung and several cracked ribs. The two crew members in the helper unit were lucky and escaped very serious injury. Since they were at the back, it received the least amount of force when the train came off the track. They desperately called dispatch for emergency services. Jeez. And Dr. Crown was fatally killed in the lead unit. There's the famous line, fatally killed. Oh, that is such a meme now in the community. Oh. He... Fatally died, I guess. I don't know, but that's just, uh, what was I thinking? I don't even know where I got the term fatally killed. I, I don't know. It wasn't, I, I don't know. I really don't know where I got that term. It's stupid. Along with Alan Reese in the third. Additionally, two other people in their homes were killed, including seven-year-old Jason Thompson and nine-year-old Tyson White, who were crushed and asphyxiated when the train destroyed one of their houses along Duffy Street. In total, four people died, and seven were injured. Then everyone asks, how could a train run away like this? And why? Vandals? Pinked air hose? Faulty brakes? A sleepy crew? What was it? Well, before that could be answered. Oh, I had cab damage to 93, uh, 9317 too. Answered, there was still more trouble. No one Why did I put heartache? An underground gas this pipeline buried six Why did I put heartache at this part? My dumbass 17 year old self must have thought, oh, fire plus Toriel. Yeah. No, it doesn't work. It's immature. It's insulting. What was I thinking? Ugh. I'm sorry, but this is, <laughs> it pisses me off. It's, I mean, I know some people like this video, but it, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Oh, gosh. Was I really that bad back then? Six feet underground. The train didn't break it, however, but after the engines and the cars were cleaned out and removed on May 25th, at 8 in the morning, a dope and a backhoe <laughs> dope was cleaning a back the Trona, but despite the clear markings Personal the much? where the pipe was, the operator accidentally made gashes into the gas line, and then all fiery hell broke loose. Not exactly. From what I remember seeing, because I recently watched the Mayday documentary, uh, the Mayday episode of this on uh, TV recently, it was on uh, the Smithsonian of all places, um, in that video, it said, you know, the gashes were made, but it took a while before, you know, that gas line eventually burst. And at first it was like a liquid, but then eventually something, probably a cigarette or something caused it to start, uh, start a fire though. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't caused when uh, the fire didn't start when the gashes were made. It was just, it was over time. At least that's what I remember from watching the video. I'll have to look that up when I remaster this. The gas leaked and caught fire, destroying 11 more houses, 21 cars, and brutally burning two residents alive in the inferno. Five of the houses that were destroyed were across the 
directly across from... Ugh, there's a bad audio cut right there. And going back to that Mayday video again, it's good. Don't get me wrong, I, that episode's alright. But I hate the, um, the uh, sequence leading up to the accident because the thing is... They have the helper crew going, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And I'm like, you're, an, you're a freaking train, not an airliner. Nobody says Mayday on the railroad. That's not an actual term. Or maybe it is. I don't know. But it was just stupid. Anyway. Duffy Street. This is the most unfitting music. Train. Exactly. Was the only I don't know what I was thinking. On Duffy Street. And that was still fully intact after the crash, but was destroyed in the fire. Four more houses received moderate smoke damage fire damage while three others only had smoke damage that's an eerie fire image burned for seven hours sending plumes of heavy smoke into the air until it was finally brought under control total property damage was over 14.3 million dollars interestingly more of this damage was from the fire instead of from the train accident okay that's actually that's true problem. and even though there were more fatalities in the derailment it's still kind of interesting Okay, total, shut up. Now six people were dead from both incidents combined. Now the whole area was like a true war zone. The residents were both horrified and furious. What was next to come? The water main breaking and then the whole street floods? Thankfully that didn't happen. Why did you mention that? After months of investigation, the FRA and the NTSB found out that before leaving Mojave Yard on May 11th, that upon the crew boarding the train, it was discovered that the original head unit, 7551, and the locomotive the train was named after. Wait a minute. When did they do this? I don't remember any of the actual Kodachrome engines getting the full SPSF treatment. Huh. Is that a Photoshop or something? That is interesting. Oh, continuing head the video. 7551 and the locomotive the train was named after was totally dead and couldn't start. And the crew were then instructed to take 8278 from another consist and add it to their own ahead of the dead 7551. Why did I add that fart also, sound? the weight of the train was severely underestimated. Okay. And the wrong tonnage Calm was down. given to the crew before they left. They were told the train was 6,151 tons. It was for promotional photo shoots. Oh, good to know. 8,900 tons after another dispatcher found the correct measurement. Plus, oh, listen all, to those dynamics. The two units had fully operational dynamics, with 7,551 still totally dead of everything. This was put together sloppily using Microsoft Paint, as you can tell. ...but its own air brakes. 7549 had traction current, but no dynamic brake current. 9340 had dynamic brakes that were rather wacky and had limited power. 8317 on the helper end also had no dynamics. Thus, among the four locomotives in the front and the set of helpers on the back, only 8278 at the front and 7443 at the back had fully functioning dynamic brake systems. Although this badge didn't know. Neither did the head end, which was something the Mayday video uh, pointed out. Because the guy in the helper crew, he said he was in full dynamic, but he was in 8317, which didn't have any dynamics. So, yeah, why would he say that if he, if he didn't have working dynamics? That's definitely giving me a lot more to think about for the remaster. Hmm. With all that weight, both the air brakes on the cars and the locomotives, as well as the dynamic brakes that were working on the two units, just couldn't handle both the grade or the weight. After the accident, calculation procedures to train weight was majorly overhauled. All four locomotives at the front of the train, 8278, 7551, 7549, and 9340, were all damaged beyond repair and destroyed. They were their damage per hundred repair and destroyed are the same thing. Sold for parts to Precision National and scrapped on site. 
and both helper units did derail, but they were still operable. 8317 was sold to Precision National, repaired, then resold to Helm Leasing for continued service. 7443 was repaired and repainted by the Southern Pacific and returned to service. It was finally retired on March 17, 2000 and sold to National Railway Equipment Company, who rebuilt it with 5 foot 6 inch gauge trucks for MRS Logistica in Brazil. I do apologize if I pronounced that wrong. No, you got it right. As 5313. All 69 hopper cars were totally destroyed and scrapped at the site. As a result of this and other runaways involving locomotives with dynamic braking, the FRA reserved its mandate that dynamic braking be disabled when train brakes are placed to emergency. Now, the mandate is that all dynamic brakes must remain functional. Eh? It's been 29 years since this crash, and despite these changes, runaways have still occurred, especially on El Cajon Pass. Cajon Pass! What it is, there's still two left I need to cover. One in 94 and one in 96. I'll tell you all about them in the future, but we have another runaway to cover that I'm sure everyone knows. Stay tuned for more. You know what? Let's do Crazy 8s then after that. <laughs> Since I hinted at it in this video. Oh, there it is. How convenient. Now, before I get started with this video, I gotta say, a lot of people took the joke at the beginning of the video seriously. One million tons, a hundred thousand lives, stuff like that. I'm not. I'm. I'm surprised that joke sailed right over everybody's heads. And before I continue with this video, speaking of which, uh, the Frankfurt uh, wreck and the uh, Cajon Pass runaway, the first one, both of those were actually put together at exactly the same time. I was working on one, then I work on the other. Do 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 do. -do. And I release both at the same time. And now that I know how to do that, I will never do that again. Because that was a lot of work. That was a lot of work. It sucked. Anyways, on with the crazy eights. It was a heart-stopping event. One million tons, 100,000 lives, and 100 minutes. And it was one we all know well. Almost unstoppable. No, not that, but... You're close. See, how did anybody this not get that joke? Of the crazy eights incident. Now, even though the topic of this was pretty serious, I still kept a little bit of a humorous tone with this video. Because the incident, when you read about it, is still pretty funny. On May 15th, 2001, a CSX engineer and conductor were going to switch a string of freight cars from track K-12 to track D-10 for departure on another train at Stanley Yard in Walbridge, Ohio. You can't have anything in Ohio. Insert Ohio SD meme here. And 47 freight cars. 25 of them were empty, but 22 were fully loaded, including Why did they put an emphasis on that? I don't know. Molten fennel, a toxic ingredient used in glues, paints, and dyes. That is Runaway train is so fitting for this video, I gotta say. The air brakes, however, weren't connected as this was just a short switching maneuver within the yard. Which makes sense. It's not illegal. No, uh, but it's still a pretty bad procedure. I mean, Nepizigit, uh, anybody? <laughs> that video I really like. That video is a good one. We'll get to that. The train moved north out of K-12, passing the conductor. Who was positioned on the Special ground thanks to Gustav Time for the footage, the even though it's slightly the inaccurate. The radio of the number of the cars that had passed him, and the engineer acknowledged. With eight cars to go, the conductor notified the engineer by radio to prepare to stop. No reply. The conductor tried again, when four cars remained. Still nothing. He then ordered the engineer to stop, but again, there was no response. I'm starting to think that's not actually true, because usually with yard moves like that, he wouldn't, you know, let him know getting ready to stop. How it would work, it'd be like five cars, three cars, three, two, one, half, truck, far enough. That's how you do it. It's not like... Okay, get ready for a stop or something like that. That's not how it works. I mean, this is what I've this is crap I've learned from not, you know, not only rail fanning but also from my uh, brakeman training. But yeah, they they don't say like oh 
you know, stop or anything like that. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm starting to think that how I worded it in the documentary isn't even that true. But whatever. Meanwhile, the engineer noticed it's that the switch and concluded that his train, although moving slowly, would not be able to stop short of it. He decided he was going to climb down from the train, correctly align the switch, and reboard the locomotive. Sounds silly, right? That's because it is. Yeah, because it is silly. Cap, the engineer applied the independent air brakes for the locomotive. Ooh, looking at this photo, those brake shoes are kind of worn. Might want to replace those. And attempted to apply the dynamic brakes as well, but failed to do so. But applying the independent air brake also disables the dead man switch, rendering it useless. That is true. He then set the throttle at notch eight or full throttle. No, he didn't. It was actually more like notch four or five. Uh, there's another video from I High Iron that gets a lot of the inaccuracies in this video cor uh, corrected. If the dynamic brakes were selected as intended, this Amtrak moment for whatever reason. I didn't. I don't know why I put the Amtrak clip in here i think it was because i didn't have any other freight train uh, clips to work with at the time so it's just like <laughs> screw it go down a lot thanks to the electric generator however since the dynamic braking was not engaged the setting only caused the train to accelerate therefore the only functioning brake was the air brake and this was not enough to counteract the engine power the engineer climbed down from the cab aligned the switch and then attempted to reboard the accelerating locomotive. He was unable to do so, slipped and fell, and was dragged about 80 feet from the train, receiving minor cuts before he had to Ouch. let go. Now, with no one on the train, it becomes a runaway, escaping This is the only the video... Line, accelerating at the, faster this is faster. one of the only videos where the, the runaway theme is appropriate. ...who had a radio, and he called the Yardmaster, and promptly notified the Stanley Tower... Oh, two donations. ...and the train master... ...from the Stick and Garrett Harry. Located in yep, Stick and uh, Garrett Harry. Thank you for the two bucks and the five bucks. Wow, 10 years, that's crazy. Great job. Also, here, Crash. Garrett Hayes says, have you ever played Choo Choo Charles? No, I am not playing that. ...was also notified. The branch train dispatcher located in Indianapolis was also notified. I still do not know how to pronounce Indianapolis. I don't know. I probably just made everybody in Indiana just cringe with the pronunciation in that video and right now. Is it Indianapolis? Indianapolis? I don't know. I'm a Philadelphian. I know how to pronounce towns like Conshohocken, and Royersford and stuff like that. But Indianapolis, I guess, I just, I just can't. Ugh. The train was now proceeding southward on the Toledo Branch, also known as the Great Lakes Division. At Galetia Siding, at approximately 1.35 p.m., the train dispatcher remotely operated a switch for the train to enter the siding. A portable derail was there, ready to derail the train and stop this runaway. However, it was thrown clear from the track by the force of the train passing over it, and the train sped on like nothing had happened along the tracks. I'm not sure how that actually worked. I'm not sure how that actually would happen then. Then local police come up with an idea. Shoot to kill. The idea? Use a buckshot on a rifle. Buckshot is a shotgun thing, not a rifle thing. You even see the guy, uh, the trooper shooting a shotgun in the next clip. Ugh. To hit a fuel shutoff button near the fuel tank. But guess what? Don't work. Has to be held in to actually do anything. That was put together via, um... Uh, uh, audacity, and uh, that, that wasn't uh, effects using a do um, I don't know, <laughs> it was still funny. Rather than pressed for a millisecond by a bullet. By the way, he also missed. That was another thing. So, Crazy 8 speeds on a little bit. A few brave locals tried jumping on board the locomotive, but they chicken out as they realize she's going much faster than intended. Meanwhile, northbound train Q Random Megalovania moment was directed by the dispatcher Under swap Megalovania to be precise. Ohio. The crew was instructed to uncouple their engine SD40-2-8392 from their train 
and wait until the runaway passed their location. Sure enough, at approximately 2 As you can see, the simulation is not 100% accurate. They portray 8888 as a nose light SD40, like a seaboard one when it was all the way up here, like the Conrail ones. And 8392 is facing the wrong way. It, it came it hooked up to the train backwards, long hood forward, not a uh, short hood forward. 5 p.m., the runaway train roared past the siding. And after the switches were realigned, 8392 chased after the runaway. Now this was fun to put together. It's probably my favorite part of the video. Even if it is slightly inaccurate. But it's still cool. Another engine, a GP38. That's a GP40, not a GP38. Was primed and ready ahead of the runaway to couple up to 8888 and push her back. The idea seemed dangerous, but was carried out nonetheless. Side rant, this is one reason why Unstoppable is not a favorite movie of mine, because in the movie, they make it as if the, you know, putting an engine on the head and then coupling from the front is the first idea. No, no railroad would do that unless it was a last minute thing. Even CSX knew that. They only place it in front in case 8392 couldn't catch up to it. Eventually, 8392 finally Thank you for the 10 bucks, Robert Vance. Once again, it's most likely my last donation for the stream as I'm going to Betty Bye in time a little bit. Ah, that's perfectly fine. Pulls up onto the runaway Thank you. At Kenton, You've done quite enough. Miles an hour. Yeah, you can see in the video, in the simulation, they have it as the short, ho short hood connects to the train. It was actually the long hood. And carefully apply the dynamic brakes, hoping the couplings won't rip apart from the force. Now this the edit was off, really cool. The train slows down to 11 miles an hour and positioned at the Route 31 crossing was CSX like how, like how, John like Hoskill. how smooth that that he was such a smooth transition. The locomotive and climbs aboard. There he immediately shuts down the engine and finally the crazy eights comes to a gentle halt. After nearly two hours and 66 miles of running, the whole thing was finally over. And the GP38 further ahead wasn't really needed anymore. 8888's brake shoes were completely burned off, and it was found that the air brake on the locomotive was in full service braking mode, and that dynamic brakes were working, but not set to braking mode. In the end, the unnamed engineer who was first hired by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1966, promoted to engineer by Penn Central in There's your problem. And a check ride with a supervisor in January 2001. Thank you for another five bucks. CSX 88 just went nope for that CSX, shot. Pretty and much. The job record was fired from CSX. 8888 had its brake shoes replaced and continued service. Uh, for excuse years. me. Sadly, several museums attempted to preserve the locomotive for its historical significance, but CSX stated themselves that the engine just wasn't worthy for preservation. It's because they're too embarrassed by the accident, that's why. That's why they didn't preserve it. And unfortunately, in 2017, it was rebuilt into an SD40-3, renumbered as CSX 4389 which still operates to this day with that weird Spongebob square cab build. I had to put this in as a text because I forgot to do it in the narration. It's been 17 years since this incident, and since then, it has inspired... Oh, he's probably still alive, Railroad Trains Gaming. And runaways have been less frequent over the years, but the Crazy 8 incident will never be forgotten. Well, that was sure inspiring. <laughs> so, uh, last but now I know somebody was re really requesting me to do Frank, uh, the Frankfurt wreck, which is also going to get remastered. So let's do it. All the way to the beginning. I do love, I do love the beginning sequence though, even though it's worded terribly. It's an accident. Locals like me remember well. 
and it's one we'll never forget. Only a 40 minute drive from where I'm sitting right now, I still get the chills as I go over that same curve where it all happened. Thinking about what happened, or what could have happened, where the deadliest accident on the Northeastern Corridor since 1987 occurred. And three years later, people still talk about this crash. They still do today. This is the story of Amtrak 188. What I thought was going to be the best documentary I ever released at the time quickly turned out to be one of my worst. This one really needs a remaster. Maybe I might do this. I would do a remaster of this at the same year, but I don't want to do what I did before, working on two documentaries at the same time. It's just way too much work, especially with my lack of free time. which was only a year old at the time, and one of the first ACS 64s Amtrak received. I don't know why I used the uh, spider Boston dance. Was the engineer of that day and had worked on the route for a few weeks now. It departed 38th Street Station at around 9:10 p.m. with its next stop. I unfortunately cannot find this variant of the, the runaway line, theme anymore. Trouble. A septa train. It's also the most unfitting music I've ever used in my videos. Also, Axel Wayne and Jordan Rail Media, please settle down. Don't think I can't see your argument in the chat. If it continues on, you two are muted. Was reporting a shattered windshield after some people threw some rocks at the lead car, blinding the engineer. The radio transmissions distracted the engineer for a brief moment. When he listened I didn't have any night shots of the corridor. This made him believe he was further down the track, past the curve. So he sped his train up to 106 miles an hour instead of the 80 mile per hour approach speed. What does the whole years later thing mean? That's just to show how late, how long ago I told the story. The speed limit of now the sound design leading up to the accident. I actually did use stuff like you know the audio recording inside an ACS 64. This was so much of a pain to sync up correctly, but it definitely paid off in the end. I really got a knack for sound design sometimes. Approaching the Even though it's a complete nightmare to get it right. With a 50 mile per hour speed limit within the curve. When he finally realized this mistake, he threw his train into emergency braking, but it was too late. You know, I just wondered. I just remembered. You notice how when he goes into the curve, the lights, which look like they're at, you know, the ditch lights are off and they're just in, uh, but they're still in, you know, high beam mode. When he goes into emergency, you see a lot more brightness before he tumbles off the track. I wonder if setting the train to emergency stop also turns on all the front lights minus the marker lights on the ACS 64. I never thought about that until now. That's interesting. Finally realized this mistake, he threw his train into emergency braking. Yeah, watch, see? Too late. I should have combined it with the other footage some uh, a security camera had. Because this footage was on the uh, front of 188. There was another angle a security camera took of the accident happening off screen. I should have combined that rather than just going into a uh, blank screen. I'll take note of that for the remaster if I ever make it. Car stand by 24, 2095, we keep getting a priority on local people traffic got over foot of a train derailment. Also a person screaming. I said it's 24. I tried to sink both the police and fire dispatches at the same time, but it quickly turns into a complete garbled mess. What I was trying to do was like get like all kinds of like radio calls going in at the same time just to show the severity of the accident. But like I said, in this case, garbling up two police, uh, three different feeds, police, uh, one police and two fire at different times to make it sound. Let's just say it was just bad. It was just one garbled mess. 
I'm just gonna skip it because it's just so bad. The locomotive began to tip and left the curve. <sighs> Ooh, I only just recognized this looking at the photo now. Ouch. Look at that. Took the catenary pole out and right into the roof of that amphi. Just inches away from the windows. Good grief. I can only imagine what would happen if there were people sitting there. Ugh. At over 100 miles an hour, the Amfleets tumbled behind and some of them ripped apart from the excessive speed as they came off the tracks. Catenary wires were also damaged when the rear pantograph lost a connection to the wire and was flung clean off the roof of the engine. Finally, after the roar of the crash subsided, I think this was the actual fire. I think this fire truck was actually responding to 188 incident. If memory serves me right, I wasn't the sure, but it was cool to use. On the way, when they arrived, some of the lightly and unhurt passengers. When they arrived on the scene, some I don't of the know why I didn't cut that out. Passengers helped haul away the more seriously injured passengers. Brandon Bossian suffered a concussion after his head slammed into the dashboard of the locomotive. Maybe airbags should be put into the cabs in the future. No, too much of an expense. Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter said that the wreck that was, guy was an absolute nuts. disastrous I hate mess, that guy. and he was very stunned at how many people were able to walk away from such a violent impact. Oh, I'm sure. Politicians. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf said, that anything that the state can do, we stand ready to do that. Yeah, right. You're a joke, too. To help out those victims. Amtrak was deeply saddened by the loss of life from the accident. Well, of course they would. And President Barack Obama <laughs> even gave his condolences after the wreck. You really think politicians care, though? That's kind of one of the reasons why I used that photo, even though it was pretty tasteless. And not uh, unnecessary to put my political views in it. Saying that he and Michelle were shocked and deeply saddened to hear, and their thoughts and prayers going to their families. In the end, eight people died, and over 200 were injured. It was the deadliest accident on the Northeastern Corridor since the 1987 Chase Marilyn incident. Then there's the question how can this happen, and why? Uh, more unnecessary undertale. I don't know if I can continue on with this. I don't know if I can continue on watching this video because it's just so bad. Oh, it's so bad. I mean, we all have to start somewhere, but I mean... <sighs> like I said... Back in the day, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I thought, you know, what I was doing was right. But when I look at it now, it just really, really makes me cringe. I'm sorry. I know some people like, you know, some people say they like it. But looking back at it, it was just like, why did I do this? Why did I do this? I mean, why? Hmm. Oh. When Brandon Boston heard the SEPTA train call in, you can barely even you can barely even hear me over this. He lost all situational awareness of his location, almost like he was lost. He thought he was past the curve at an area such as Croydon, where trains increased their speed to 105 miles an hour. That actually is Croydon. As there you go. Here. Brandon Boston's lawyer and Boston himself even stated that. He knew very little about what happened before the crash leading up to the impact thanks to that nasty concussion he sustained when his head hit the dashboard, which would have been like a head-on collision with a car in the passenger seat without working airbags. Durr. And also, look at that, Conrail vest. But then again, this is a CSAO yard, so it makes sense. Unlike previously discussed crashes, Boston wasn't on drugs wasn't an alcoholic, or had any terroristic or suicidal intent. Heck. <laughs> Freaking ISIS flag. 
but they are a terrorist group, so I'm not apologizing for that. He wasn't even using his phone or staring at trespassers or the occasional foamer. <clears throat> what? He simply just forgot where he was. And some say 601 was possibly hit by rocks. <laughs> I can't continue this. I'm sorry. It is just that bad. It is just that bad. And then the PTC promotion. Uh, you know what? I still have to continue. I'm forced to. But most likely, those were loose ballast rock flying right into the engine's nose as it derailed. Yeah, that's an interesting theory that people still discuss. Did people actually throw rocks into 601? I'm more believing that that was just ballast rock throwing up at the top. But then again, how would they be able to reach up there? But you believe what you want to believe. And plowed off the tracks. Not to mention, this isn't a first time a train derailed by this spot. In 1943, the Pennsylvania Railroad Congressional Limited derailed nearby the very spot 188 crash when a hot box occurred on the seventh car of the train, derailing all the cars behind. That ragged killed 79 and injured 107. I gotta make a video on that one day. to tackle the elephant in the room now that is still subject of debate today. It's been argued that the curb should have been equipped with positive train control, which works a lot like- I mean, I love Undertale, don't get me wrong, but it just has no place in these videos. The train protection and warning system used in the UK. It uses GPS to know where a train currently is, where it's going, and how fast it's going, which is sent to the local dispatch center. CTEC moment. CETC, or CTEC, located at 30th Street Station. All right, side note here. Um, I remember watching the Pentrex DVD of the Northeastern Corridor. And I was like wondering, because they said, I think they mentioned that the, these things had touchscreen. And I was like thinking to myself, how the hell do you make a touchscreen out of a CRT? Is that even possible? If anybody, if I'm sure the boomers in the comments could definitely uh, explain that for us. Over to you guys. Located at 30th Street Station. When it detects the train is either approaching a red signal, going too fast past a yellow, at risk of colliding with another train, possibly a runaway with no engineering control, or if the train is about to hit misaligned switches switched against a train's path, it gives advanced warning to the engineer, usually heard by a series of beeps like this. Okay, that actually is PTC. At least I think it is. This will give time for the engineer to react accordingly but after a set amount of time, usually 10 to 30 seconds, the train automatically goes into full emergency, stops where it's at, and locks the controls unless it's reset. I don't know if it actually locks the controls. It just puts you into an emergency and penalty application. The deadline for such a system to be installed was at the end of 2015, according to Congress. I guess it should have been a little sooner. As a result, PTC was mandated on all Amtrak lines, and all the ACS-64s were cleared first. The P-42s usually used on the Pennsylvanians, however, had to wait a little longer before being cleared for the system, so ACS-64s would have to tow them between Harrisburg and Philly. That's actually true. I remember seeing that back in the day. And a little fun fact, you ever wonder why Amtrak 145 likes to stay up in the East Coast? It was in 30th Street at the right place at the right time when 188 happened, so it became one of the first P-42s cleared for uh, ASIS on the Keystone Corridor. And the reason why there's a Bandicam logo at the top for this clip, I did actually have the clip at the time. The problem was it was not importing correctly onto Windows Movie Maker, so I had to screen record it in order to get it to work. It was stupid, but I had no other choice, but... Yeah, I remember catching that a couple of times. It was it was unusual, but made sense. And funny enough, Phase 3 Heritage Unit 145 was one of the first P-42s to be cleared for that line. Zepto was also hell-bent on positive train control since the crash and became one of, if not the first commuter railroad to have positive train control on... Okay, 
I gotta explain this clip because I get asked this all the time in the comments section. Some people thought either uh, this woman was upset I was filming her uh, or something like that. In reality, she was asking if I... Th I think she was asking if I had any SEPTA tokens or any spare change or something like that. You know, your typical, f you know, Philly uh, hoodlum, stuff like that. I don't know. But uh, I was a little bit... It kind of uh, threw me off when I was filming this SEPTA train coming in at Temple, but... Yeah, that if you want, if you're wondering what was going on in that clip, she was asking if I had like either SEPTA tokens back when they existed or uh, spare change, you know, spare change, spare change. Yeah, bad joke, I know. You 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 get people like that all the time in Philly, though. Don't get me wrong, and if they do ask, I I'd be careful. I'd be very careful because you never know sometimes all their lines, with the Warmester line being first on April 18th, 2016, until finally the Wilmington Newark, Trenton, and Paoli Thorndale lines, all shared by Amtrak, being the last ones to complete positive train control on May 1st, 2017. My line, the Maniac Norristown, had PTC fully installed yep, on there's my line. 2016. Positive train control would have likely prevented this crash, although to this day it is still debated even among rail fans like myself. Yeah. In the end, ACS 64601, which was thought to have been put away for repairs, as stated in one of my older videos, but That's now true. it's been confirmed, it, 601 was deemed damaged beyond repair. It will serve as a source of spare parts for now, for anything that's still intact in the unit, alongside 627, which was also deemed to have damaged to fix after hitting a backhoe in Chester, some guy actually said they're working on repairing 627 and that 601 on his uh, is already no they said 627 was already repaired and they had seen it and that 601 was next for repairs and i was like uh -huh, sure but yeah i at this point i'm pretty sure 601's already been scrapped someone said the last time they saw it it was like completely tarped in somewhere in delaware I'm not 100% sure, but either way, we it's obvious that we're never going to see them again. A year later, Amtrak had to settle plaintiffs and punitive damages to victims valued at over $200 million. Wow. Hmm. Brandon Boston, however, wouldn't face criminal charges, according to Philadelphia prosecutors, who said this on May 9th, 2017. But... Last year, on the second anniversary of the crash, May 12th, 2017, Bossian turned himself in and was arrested, and prosecutors presented various charges against Bossian. These included involuntary manslaughter and reckless endangerment. However, on September 12th, 2017, Philadelphia Judge Thomas Garrett dismissed all criminal charges, much to the frustration of prosecutors, victims, their families, and even locals. I mean, it's still heavily debated today if he should have been criminally charged for the accident. My dad, even though he's uh, not a Ralph and like me, he said he should have been flat out charged in general. Me, I'm kind of in the middle, you know? It's really hard to, because I don't know. It, I would have to see more uh, about the incident, but yeah, you know, my dad does have a point. This wasn't the end of the story. On February 6th of this year, after an appeal by PA's Attorney General's office, the case was reopened and the same charges were brought against Boston again. <laughs> Got a comment. Look at this guy's face with the camera. <laughs> I don't know. It just looks silly. The guy with the camera. And we still do not know what the ruling is so far. I can give you an update. He's been acquitted again. And then again, the, a good point some people even listed is why did they charge uh, charge him for the same stuff already when that's against uh, one of the amendments because it's a double jeopardy, which is a really, really good point. I'm not sure how they... Well, then again, politicians and other people in power get away with crimes every day, but we're not allowed to do it. It's It's really ambiguous. But, bull crap aside, who crash, cares? But some rail agencies are still struggling to install positive train control due to its cost 
and complexity, including New Jersey Transit, who is already in enough financial trouble with the lack of cars, leasing mark coaches, and the lack of funding. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. There seems to be a stigma again between SEPTA and New Jersey Transit uh, f uh, rail fans where one hates the other. You know, SEPTA's bad. No, AJT's bad. <laughs> it's pretty stupid, but I mean, I couldn't help myself. But yeah, even my cousin uh, who lives in Jersey, he hates NJT service as well, and I don't blame him. Amtrak even threatened to SEPTA ain't any better, though. To Trenton on Amtrak trackage if they didn't get PTC installed on a certain date. And they're still struggling to do that as of February 16th, 2018. Issue's been resolved. That's without mentioning the Hoboken incident that happened not too long I've been requested ago. to do that video eventually. I still get the chills as I go over that same curve where it all happened, even on a SEPTA train. But knowing the lesson, but knowing the lessons we finally learned after this incident, we hopefully shouldn't see another crash like this. Mm. That is true. This is the exact location. And I do still do that. Yep. That music and that video is probably going to get this stream copyrighted, but oh well. But yeah, that was 188, probably one of the worst doc. Now, now that I think of it, this was probably one of the worst documentaries I've made. Not as bad as the Soulliner video one that I've since got rid of, but yeah, it's it was bad. It was very bad. I'm not even gonna lie. I'm not even gonna lie. It was bad. Now, why don't we look at something that's a little bit better and stop torturing myself? Let's see. Gotta find my place where I was again. Um. Oh, oh, D Diff, Danny in the Hall. This is a uh. Not many people probably knew about this, but during high school, um, my throughout my senior, uh, junior and senior year in high school, mainly my senior year, um, me and a good friend of mine named Danny. We used to do uh, host this show called uh, Danny. The show was called In the Hall, and every year um, it would basically play every Friday, uh, usually play uh, once every week, usually on Fridays. There were two of them this year. Uh, it would help you, like, all right, let me try and re-explain uh, re it. So basically our school uh, has, like, a TV program uh, where we do all the morning announcements instead of, you know, the principal doing it over the PA system because, you know, it gives, you know, guys like me a little something to test out our future careers with. But, um, yeah, um, one of the fun series we uh, used to do sometimes is Danny uh, is, a, is a in the hall. And every year that it would change to a new senior uh, pair to do them. In 2018, which is when, when I became a senior, it was two hosts. It was Zach in the hall and Danny in the hall, or Diff, and that's uh, where I come in because uh, I was the co-host of that. Danny was usually uh, in front of the camera. I was usually behind, but we'd switch every so often. And let me just say, that was a lot of fun. That You know, even though my high school years were a bit of a uh, roller coaster, especially my freshman year where I was really depressed, Senior year, I had a lot of fun. This series was a lot of fun to be uh, to put together. Uh, even though it's a, it's since ended, I still keep in contact with my friend Danny because I usually like to help out with him sometimes on his college projects. He's a, he was a really fun guy. And like I said, a lot of my editing skills, like the key framing that I mentioned earlier with Adobe, I actually learned from putting uh, these episodes together. It was a lot of fun. So we're going to watch one of these set episodes. It's going to be the one I mainly put together. Uh, you can probably tell which one that is, which is this one. I mean, we used a lot of old equipment for the videos, like those old suitcase cameras. But trust me, I had a lot of fun putting these videos together. They're coming through the back door. Oh, Anchorman reference.
That sequence was fun to put together, but it was hard to edit. Hey, ever seen Thomas? Oh my gosh, I forget this guy's name. He also helped out with some of our videos, but he was a really funny guy. We had a lot of fun working with him. He'd help out every so often. I don't know where Thomas is. That's Danny. Well, because I needed his help. <laughs> <laughs> I literally took one of my real fanning videos and spliced myself in getting hit like that. It was so bad. It's one of those clips that is just so bad, it's funny. And I just couldn't help myself. But uh, it quickly became a running joke throughout the episode. You're going to see that later. The tripod lifts. Oh yeah, they are heavy. Don't get me wrong. So if you could use any transportation mode to get to school, what would it be and why? Little fun fact, that is a legit SEPTA vest that I brought to school for this actual episode. Um, just to flaunt around with it. <laughs> um, I can't say where I got it. Uh, I got it from a SEPTA employee whose name is going to be anonymous uh, because I want to protect his identity. But yeah, he gave me two of them. I used one of them for the video and yeah, it was... <laughs> It came in very handy for this video. You find them all over the place anyway. I love how she's just cringing from how silly of a question this was. Basically, Danny in the hall, uh, basically in the hall, we were basically, um, our job was literally to harass people in the hallways about silly questions with a camera. <laughs> But it was fun! It was fun! I gotta admit, it was fun! <laughs> oh, it was bad, but it was fun. A submarine. There you I go. Would ride a bike. A simple bike. Putting your own muscle into it. <laughs> that was my friend Danny uh, using uh, one of the studio microphones, just going... <laughs> <laughs> and then just having a little clip art of the bike going by. Oh, man. Like I said, we we really went rampant with this with this series. Uh, it was just it was just pure randomness. The trains. The trains. The there you go. There's the running joke. You're gonna see that again. Any transportation mode to get to school besides like a car or a bus. What would it be and why? <laughs> um, I would use like a flying car. Just flying over traffic, right? There you go. I would fly. That's one of my things I want to do. Uh, am I smart? That's true. Superhero power is I would be able to fly myself. Uh, a thousand pigeons. So I can probably the most creative time. answer we ever had. Like first off, you're already flying, so that's cool. Second off, you have a, you have a thousand pigeons to just attack anybody you want. That was probably my favorite answer of the uh, series. It was just so creative. Like, it was overly complex, but over like so freaking creative. Like, like I said, it was it was a good it was a good answer. I like that one. <laughs> you find freaking pigeons all over the place in freaking Philly. Just go to Philly or New York in the center uh, in the center square. You'll be surrounded by the bastards. A bike. Me, I probably say hoverboard. Yeah. Well, not one of those stupid things with two wheels. Like, not those yeah, things. Off the ground. Back to the future. There you go. Like in Back to the Future. Exactly. Exactly what I was thinking. No, not a Segway. Yeah, Segway. No, actually, Segways are cool too. <laughs> well, Thomas, I think I. That is my friend Jamie. We know each other pretty well uh, back in high school, so I already knew what her answer was gonna be. Use a septa. Septa train. Yep. There you go. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. If she's watching, by the way, shout out to you. You are awesome. It's for you. Aw, oh, thanks. So, what about you? <laughs> he has a <laughs> thousand pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't. Like I said, I can't. This is this is why one of my favorite episodes for a good reason. Because of so many creative jokes. I just have to see that one again. So, what about you? <laughs> Someone a thousand pigeons. <laughs> I'm taking a private jet. I think that's the move for sure. Nice. That's how I go. A race car. <gasps> oh, I want 
the dragon from the never ending story. Oh yeah, that guy. Oh man. But yeah, this was probably the most fun episode. Attic Sheath, that's the guy's name. Yeah, he was uh he was just in the studio at the time and we needed an extra, so we were like, screw it. But yeah, he's helped out on a lot of my videos before. So yeah, that was the, uh, probably my favorite episode of Dith. If you're curious to see what I was like in high school, definitely go check it out. Uh, check out the whole series. It is It was a lot of fun to work on that. Um, Chores is another favorite of mine. We'll, we'll watch that one. Dith? Hey, Clark. You need this for something? Danny? Thomas? That was our uh, TV teacher, uh, Mitz, uh, William Clark. Really awesome guy. He was the guy behind, uh, you know, all the projects. Like, even though we were in TV class and everybody was tasked with doing a random, like, video, like, oh, a commer infomercial or whatever for their projects, we were, uh, me and Danny, who, uh, you know, this, uh, that's Danny, there's me, we were excused from all those projects because all we had to do was make Danny in the Hall episodes. And, yeah, this guy... He is really, really awesome. We, we, I have a lot of good memories with him. Hey, Clark, you need this for something? In fact, now that I think of it, he kind of reminds me a lot of Steven Spielberg. He even has the look, the beard, the hair, everything. <laughs> he was our high school's uh, Steven Spielberg. Danny, Thomas, I got a special job for you. What is it? <laughs> uh -huh. It's so simple, but it was such a great idea. <clears throat> Classic Three Stooges comedy. Trust me, small dogs are way more violent than you would think. What is the worst chores you've ever done growing up? The worst chore, huh? Well, I'm probably taking out the trash. Good point. I'm um, taking out the trash. Taking out the trash. That was probably our most common answer, uh, taking out the trash. Cleaning the toilet. Wait, really? Yeah. <laughs> cutting the grass kind of sucks too, but yeah, probably washing the dishes. I like cutting the grass. Laundry. Huh? You don't like washing the dishes either? Well, I only wash my own dishes personally. Cleaning the dishes. Oh, yeah. Well, that was I mean, another common answer. I cook sometimes too, so I make a huge mess and my parents get really upset with me. Accurate. So I, have to cook, I have to clean my own dishes. Accurate. Especially with my, especially when my girlfriend bakes. We may, uh, when she and I, uh, Make stuff together we make a huge mess sometimes <laughs> and if she's watching as well firewolf shout out to you you're the best thing that has ever happened to me or not thing excuse me the hell am i how did i word that you're the best person i ever met in my life sounds a little better cleaning the garage i hate doing the dishes like all of it or just one in particular <laughs> like all of them do you hate loading in the dishes or taking the dishes out? What was I thinking when I asked that? I mean, loading in is obviously more disgusting, but putting them away is also annoying because, you know, you don't, sometimes, you know, sometimes you forget where everything goes sometimes. But I don't know. I don't know why I asked that. It was a weird question. Loading in. Disgusting. Uh, cutting grass. <laughs> that was I fun. Sorting out through dirty laundry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Especially. did you get paid good? No. No? How much? Nothing. Oh. Ouch. Cleaning my room. Really? Was it that messy? No, it wasn't that messy, but just every week my parents would say, clean your room. Uh, I don't have, I don't really do chores. I get my way out of them. You are so lucky. I don't know, making my bed. You're lazy like me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably vacuuming the whole house. Vacuuming? I love vacuuming. I'll admit, yeah, vacuuming was one of my favorite chores, especially as a kid. I still like doing it today. Unless said vacuum decides to be a pain in the butt. Like a dirt devil. I hated dirt devils. Every one of them I worked with just always broke. They were just cheap, cheap crap. For me, it was Bizzle. 
uh, Shark, and Dyson's. I loved using all three of those brands. They, they just worked. Eureka was kind of 50-50. Yeah, I know. I somehow know a lot about vacuums. I don't know why. <laughs> I love doing we actually did lose the power when we were filming this. I don't know what exactly happened. Uh, the snow was probably a good giveaway back there. But yeah, somehow in the middle of the, the recording here, it just it just went out like that. And it was just worked out well for the end of the video, though. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a, that was a, um, probably my second favorite from Danny in the Hall. You know, just all the uh, it was a simple idea, obviously, but it was just. We just went off the rails with it, you know, in terms of how making it work. Um, what's another one I could do? Oh, the engines of SEPTA videos. Um, because another problem I had with Windows Live Movie Maker was the audio balance, especially if I uh, was loud at some point. Uh, in the video, I'm not sure if I'm gonna watch that one. Uh. Yeah, you know what? What the heck? Skip through the intro. Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Engines of Sp Stupid Squirrel. Well, we didn't have a squirrel put out the power once at one of our schools. We had a snake. Uh, yeah, when I used to go to middle, uh, excuse me, at middle, uh, middle school and, uh, our cult, uh, the, well, it's actually, it was actually an intermediate school, but, um, uh, we actually had a snake, uh, make its way into the, the power box for the school. It fried itself on one of the wires and totally killed this power in the school for a couple of days. And just for the graduate uh, for the students leaving uh because uh it was, i was in eighth grade when it happened just before i became a freshman at high school for the end of the year slideshow they showed the cooked remains of the snake at the end and everybody was like yes <laughs> nothing but a bunch of like immature 13 and 15 year olds just cheering for a burnt carcass of a snake oh man that, those were the days I think it was a gardener steak though. It was pretty small. I think it was about like <clears throat> about like this big. Excuse me. Slow speed run as it's called now. But that's another story. You could hear it was pretty quiet, but you'll hear eventually why. Or as everyone calls them, the Morristown bullets. Oh, Thomas 1 Edward 2 Henry 3 reference for those of you that don't know. Getting close. Still oh, for God's sake, not another one. Because you could hear how I was pretty loud in that section of the audio. It quite uh, the um, the volume, uh, the automatic audio meters quieted down the rest of the recording. So that's why I sound so quiet like this to the point where you could barely hear me until I started yelling like this. So yeah, that was another annoyance with uh, Windows Movie Maker. But yeah, that joke was because every time I turn on the local news. Not that I like watching the news anyway, because it's all a bunch of crap. Um, it would just be shooting in Philly, shooting in Philly, shooting in Norristown, shooting in Darby. Teacher has sexual intercourse with her student. <laughs> no, seriously, that that you hear that a lot. It's it's weird. Anyway, on with the video. There you go. Thank you. This is the story on the Norristown bullets. That signal, because this is Bryn Mawr Station. That signal isn't there anymore. I want to see an animal get cooked if they bite down on the wires. You're dark, dude. But your name suggests that. No step on snack. This is 100% true. People really seem to forget how much we owe our high-speed train history across the world to this little interurban car here, this little bullet car. Like, a lot of people seem to forget that. 
but you know nobody cares about Philadelphia these days even back then well actually back then it was like one of the go-to places it was one of the places to be but nowadays we can't uh, the city can't find enough craps for everyone to give but you know that's uh, that's politics fault Did the Norristown trains before the M5s came have three cars or no? Yeah, sometimes you'd have three cars, like in here. With 11 going to the Philadelphia and Western, number 201 and 211. No, it was 200 to 210, because there's 200 right here. That's an inaccuracy. In 1932, the Fonda Johns County Robertsville Railroad purchased five bullet cars, numbered 125 to 130. I had to include the FJ and G bullets, even though technically they don't have, uh, technically, you know, um, you know, technically they're not that much in common, just the body shape, but I felt like adding them anyway, because I feel like just like the Philly and Western or the Pig and Whistle, they don't get talked about as often as they should, and a lot of history behind them. A couple of people in the comments were grateful that I did uh, mention them. The FJ and G needs to deserve just as much love as the pig and whistle. Exclusively on third rail trains, while the FJ and G cars use 600 volt overhead wires and trolley poles, as well as trolley wheels. The trolley wheel I was referencing, for those that don't know, is this one right here that rides the wires, not the actual axles like the wheels on the car. Just this one right here on the pole. The Philly cars measure 55 feet in length. Traction motors capable of over 400 horsepower. The bullet's maximum speed was over 92 miles an hour, but one did manage to reach 100 miles per hour while testing. That's Bridgeport right there. Such speed Bridgeport Viaduct. Sci fi like back in those days. The FJ and G cars on the other or at least I think. Are 46 feet 11 inches. No, it's not. Never mind. And could only run it at a maximum speed of 75 miles an hour, which was still pretty fast. The Norristown bullet started off with Wabco AA1 horns, but over the years, as the horns became more and more scarce, they were replaced with Wabco AA2s. I'm not sure how true that is, that they had Wabco AA2s. That is an original AA1. By the way, isn't it funky that a SEPTA bullet operates the same, uh, this SEPTA bullet uh, at the trolley museum operates the same way as its FJ and G counterparts, you know, with the trolley pole? Freaking hilarious. I actually do have a Wabco A2, long bell. In my car somewhere. Considered to be the granddaddies of high-speed trains, which is very true. The Japanese Udaku 3000 series SE romance car was inspired by the casing of the bullets, and in 1957 set a record of over 90.1 miles an hour, which was a new record for nowadays trains. The bullets are also considered to be the ancestors of any high-speed trains of today, such as the Eurostar, KGV, the Ice. Cans and bullet trains, the AVE, and even the Acela Express of Amtrak. Very true. We owe a lot of our history for high speed trains to the pig and whistle bullets. Which is what I tried to do with this video. I tried to lift up the history on not just the Philly and, uh, on the uh, bullets, but also the pig of Philly and Western as well. This is actually the map of the PSTC, which was a uh, predecessor to SEPTA at the time. A lot of these routes, unfortunately, uh, don't exist anymore. Like, especially toward Collegeville and Trap, because these area, this area right here is where I grew up. And then I currently live right about here. No railroad crossing. And that's very true. Almost all double tracked to reduce and prevent head-on collisions. 
with the only single track section between Bridgeport Station and the end of the Bridgeport Viaduct before it gets into Morristown. This has been standard on almost all forms of SEPTA rail, especially regional rail. If that wasn't enough to enhance the bullet's potential, the track and signal systems were heavily upgraded time after time to emit full high speed. In one test run, a bullet covered the 13.5 miles of track between Morristown and 69th Street and Upper Dump in less than 11 I am pro I kind of regret using Upper Dump, even though that's kind of the nickname for the Upper Derby area. When you're in a professional uh, environment like this, I should have just said Upper Derby. But live and learn. By one third, from 24 minutes to 16 minutes, including stops and speeds of over 80 and 90. 50 and 60s radio. Try 20s and 30s. Unfortunately, due to the Great Depression in the 1930s and the increasing number of cars piling up on America's roads, this prevented further sales of bullets to the mill. However, that didn't stop these cars from making impact on SEPTA and Philadelphia history in general. The Bullets, for a short amount of time, ran alongside the Lehigh Valley Red Devils on the Liberty Bell Limited Line. These would run on the same tracks as the Norristown Bullets until reaching Norristown, where they got onto Main Street Station and continue on... This is true. You still see some of the remnants of that at Main Street Station. That's Norristown Transportation Center, except it was a lot further back, a little bit past the courthouse compared to where it's located today, funny fact. And, whoa, 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 back up a minute, back up a minute. Popularly known as the Red Arrow. Is that a Vader? A small Vader-style signal? Huh. Interesting. That literally looks like the modern day Vaders that you see everywhere on most Class 1 railroads. Huh. Cool. Who knew? They look like doodle bugs. Yeah, but they're electric, so they kind of don't count as doodle bugs, because doodle bugs were mainly gas or diesel. There's the Reading line down there. The reason why I put really Italian sounding music at this point of the video was kind of because the Philadelphia area used to be full of Italians back in the day. So a lot of the old employees that used to be on SEPTA at the time uh, were all Italians as well. Like this one guy named Vinny uh, used to be uh, in Bryn Mawr a lot. He was a signal maintainer. He get paid overtime for sitting on his butt doing bugger all, but when the signals went down, that guy really knew his stuff. He always blew up the freaking Bryn Mawr uh, break room too. Regardless, the bullets managed to have a very long service life thanks to their built quality. There's another example of the quick narration because of the limited timing with the uh, editing. Operators and riders. One former bullet driver once said, "You could fill up a full glass of red wine in a martini glass." Put it on the dashboard, and that thing ain't going to spill a drop at all. That was true. They were very smooth riders. The N5s freaking are like, freaking wobble all over the place. Transit vehicles, of course, came and went on the Norristown High Speed Line, such as the Red Arrows and the Sea. Didn't JG Bro make doodle bugs as well? Yes, they did. Including ones for SEPTA. Not SEPTA. Um, Pennsylvania Railroad. The hell was I thinking? Despite the rather reliable bullets, they were reaching over 60 years in service, and soon the bullets were kind of like the were like the GG ones of SEPTA, if you think about it, in terms of how long they lived, or the N New York City, uh, what are they called, the R62s? I don't know. Ah, come on, I'm walking here. Yep. <clears throat> it's 
kind of like a full scale model railroad. I wouldn't say it was like a model railroad. It was a standard gauge in her urban. I hate those things. I hate those things. Oh my gosh, they accelerate nice, but they are just ugh. I hate those things. Bit of a stab at the silver liners. Test by 1993, and soon delivery finally Crappy MS Paint animation check. So SEPTA sued ADB Traction for punitive damages. The case was eventually such a stupid sketch. I tried to Amtrak 365, but I failed. Then the train kit, I don't think they would ever do that, but it'd be nice. 203, 207, and 208 are at the Seashore yeah. Power Museum in Ken Funk, Maine. 204's body was sent to the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. 204 was sadly scrapped as of 2014, as far as I remember. There's a comment in the video saying that. More like a, a worm to a butterfly, but I don't know. Yikes. There's a car... There's a car, I forget who owns it, I think it's a Pig and Whistle one, that's in a similar state in uh, Skipback. It's at a hotel. That's right, the bullets lasted 10 more years. Alright, now, enough of the older stuff, let's start looking at some of our more recent, or my recent uploads. Not too recent, but you know. Um, <clears throat> let's see. All right, Axel, please knock off and uh, knock it off. I've already warned you once. Also, 206 is at Steamtown, not uh, Rock Hill Trolley Museum. I did say one of the cars was at Steamtown. Eh, I don't know. Oh, oh, this rail fan video. Yeah, There's a reason why I want to point out this one. Not just because of the old sites, but there's one clip in particular I want to mention. It's actually this one right here. Um, there's a bunch of other clips that I took that day I could I could talk about. But this one in particular, I want to talk about. The one with uh, 39G having 1800. So the story was, 1800 was obviously one of two NS SD70 ACCs that had the yellow bonnet paint scheme, as people like to call it. I like to call it the Tails livery, because, you know, people call 4000, 4001 Sonic, the 4003 to 4005 being Shadow, and 8520 knuckles so 1800 and 1801 since they're yellow call them tails so i heard it was on 38g i missed it but it was coming back on 39g and i was like dang i wish it would lead i wish it was leading but then after catching it in bridgeport i was like i'm glad it wasn't leading you'll see why Yeah, X Conrail Dash 8 in the lead. 
Bridgeport used to always echo of those horns back in the day, before I started rail fanning here a lot. I'll skip to when he gets closer to me. This was filmed on my phone because I didn't expect because uh, I I didn't have anything else to record at the time. It even had the old GE steel bell too. Look at that. Still has the places for the marker lights. Still has the GE steel. Be cool to see. It's probably the only time I've ever seen a Dash 8 lead. An NS one. X Conrail, too. Oh, <laughs> I gotta point that out. Little DNH shield inscripted on the side. <laughs> that was my first time getting 1800 as well. But yeah, I was upset it wasn't leading at first, but as soon as I started hearing that RS3L on 8322, I was like, I'm glad it wasn't leading. <laughs> I'd eventually would get it leading at some point, but still. Oh man, that was that was. Okay. You could also get a great comparison between the chugging of that dash eight compared to that roar of the uh, eighteen hundred, which was also pretty cool. So yeah, I just wanted to point that clip out because you know, I just wanted because you know I just remembered that video. That was exactly that was on April third, twenty nineteen as well. That clip, which would have been twenty thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, six years after I created my channel. Isn't that crazy? Um, and then a bunch of other rail fanning videos. You know, nobody watches them anyway, though. So, uh, everybody watches the documentaries. Um, let's see. It's well, starting to get a little late, so I'm gonna wrap this video up at some point. Um, so, probably watch one or two more videos and then I'm going to call it a night um, let's see we'll do the Nepisgit video aren't you tired sleep is fuzzy week probably do this one the Chase Maryland remaster Being and then yeah, probably the Chase Maryland remaster after this, and then that'll be it. Way train can be a terrifying experience for anyone. You could easily get killed or injured. And often, with how heavy trains can be, once that runaway starts, it's very hard to get it to stop. Uh -oh. I told you that guy. I told you something was up. Love this movie. One such railroader, there's the badass the himself, Donald, had such an experience, and it is one he will never forget. On March 9, 1987, 60 year old engineer McDonald was operating Canadian National Work Extra 9548 on the Nepisiguit subdivision. There's an inaccuracy. It's Nepisiguit. Got a few comments on that one. He was going to perform a series of switching maneuvers at the Brunswick Mines, where the train was to collect 23 cars. The train consisted of two General Motors diesel GP40-2Ws, numbered 9548 and 9457. These were Canadian builds that were almost identical to the American Electromotive Division GP40-2. Bit of an inaccuracy here. That's an SD40-2, not a GP40. Who's sporting the same build style and primary? Or at least, no, wait, 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 wait. Is it a GP40? Let me look that up. Yeah, it is an SD40-2. Over, but with a wide cab instead of the EMD standard cab. To get the cars they needed, you know, the Cannon Group is notorious for making films on the, the cheap. That could explain why Runaway Train seems like it's low budget, cars. but it's so freaking underrated. Take 23, or so they thought. 
Engineer McDonald was alone in the cab of the lead engine, and as instructed, he coupled the engines with the cars in tracks B-226, B-225, and B-224, culminantly in that order. He was then required to initiate a reverse movement back from track 24 toward the yard limit. At the beginning of his backward movement, Engineer McDonald could not be aware of how many cars he was pulling, although it was usual to collect approximately 23 cars. It is common ground that his view was obscured It was very laggy uh, when I was trying to use this, but well by the it was at least so he would have to rely on adequate with Trainman Court via radio who would be an extra set of eyes for him. Court contacted him on the radio. Yeah, I think after this video, I'll react to the Chase Maryland remaster, was not and then uh, it is I'll call it a night. Cars from one track to another, that a train Can you make a remake of the Hinson train the crash? The yep, that is scheduled. Cars Stay tuned. switched around are not being hooked up to the air brake system. This was normal practice at, at Brunswick Mines at the time. When the train is fully assembled, the air hoses are then hooked up so all the cars have their own braking force, and on they would go. In their normal course, therefore, assuming a load of 23 cars, McDonald would not expected any need to couple the air brake system until he had completed assembly. I would always hook up the air brakes. Unbeknownst to the engineer, however, and contrary to the impression he took from whatever train man court may have said, he was in fact pulling 31 cars, all heavily loaded with ore, not 23. He pulled the train I was using the uh, CN Holly sub for this video. It's very easy to tell. I didn't have any other CN routes. Independent brakes. However, to his I hoods are endangered species on NS. It instead accelerated. Mm, sort of. At that point, his two locomotives. SD80 aces are the best. Those don't exist. downhill grade. XL. McDonald realized. I thought I made my warning clear. He then applied the emergency brakes, but they had no effect either. The train continued to accelerate down the hill. The engineer was now the only crew member left aboard the train, the others being in the caboose, which was uncoupled. On or track train runaway, why that sound familiar? Yard. Yeah. Real audio clips. This was uh, one of the best parts about making the video. Oh, didn't know that. Didn't know that uh, they're, they're exports. Hmm. Learn something new every day. This has got to be the most Canadian recording I've ever heard. Too soon, Jessica. Too soon. The train then flies down the grade, reaching speeds of over 75 miles an hour. Now, the origin the behind the U.S. flag for the miles per hour for the Imperial units and the globe for the uh, metric, uh, I got the idea from uh, uh, Mustard. Because uh, he, he did something similar for some of his videos, and I felt like doing it just because, why not? Of his runaway train. Someone even commented that During it was smart for Wesley to descent, uh, blow the horn the for the crossings because a lot of them were rural McDonald's crossings like cross bucks or just uh, lights, the so they wouldn't be used, and they're not used to set, uh, they were used to slow 50 mile per hour mine runs, not a freaking 75 mile per hour runaway. He then notified emergency services of the ensuing emergency and to prepare for the worst. Wesley, is there no way that you can clear get, get off of that train? For the love of heavens, over. Well, I can't get off her. Well, I think you better bail off into a snow bank if you can do it at all. Oh, right, I don't know. I do have links to the full audio of the incident down below in the video description of this video in particular if you're curious. going to go down with this train he go down fighting, trying to see if there was any other way to slow or stop the runaway. 
I also should point out I used the wrong rolling stock. I used like these coal hoppers instead of the uh, gondolas because I didn't know what the cars looked like. I mean, I did know what I lo what they looked like, but I couldn't find exact matches for the simulation. <laughs> Favorite part of the video there. Get the hell out of the way! Well, get the hell out of the way then, Palmer. I don't know why that uh, that exchange makes me laugh every time. Is making YouTube videos frustrating? Depends. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Excuse me. He was a modern area Ke Casey Jones, except he lived in a way. Oh my gosh, this guy was a moron. Yep. How do you expect him to stop at a switch at 75 mile an hour like that? This shows how inept, mentally inept, a lot of these friggin' government officials that run these class one railroads today are. Oh, yeah, yeah. The locomotives and all 31 cars left the track, doing almost 70 miles. Can you make one on the St. Paul on the then, uh, Valentine's Day? Run away. The engines came to a rest on their side. Usually, that's Hoppers not a good time for me to make the videos, but I Some might just men produce it next year in uh, January and just release it in February. But we'll see what happens. Expecting McDonald to be dead. No, Jessica, he's just a government official. That's that's all you need to know about how dumb he is. Yeah, you at, Neil? I'm very good here. Can you see the engines? Yeah, they look at the underside. Anytime you hear engines on their side, you can expect injuries. Miraculously, Engineer McDonald had survived the violent crash, and he crawls out the second. You think they manage to CP and KCS are fine? CP, no. KCS. Lucky to escape with his life. Kinda. Fortunately, no fire occurred in the engines. Despite you can see they look like ordinary gondolas in this shot here. I didn't have anything that could match. It sucks, How but... This happen? <clears throat> what are you gonna do? I wouldn't have trust the government to tie my shoes. For accurate. Not Very accurate. Being hooked up, especially at the mines. Also, there was no way McDonald would have known he was pulling 31 cars instead of the 23. Since there'd be little difference in the acceleration of the train, since the engines have more than enough power to move either number of cars. At first, the brakes were suspected to have failed. However, they were found to be in working order. Even though they're engines. composite shoes, which so suck. I hate those things. They took too many cars and did not hook up the air, which was against a bulletin stating all trains switching at the mines must have the air hoses hooked up at all times. However, in an interview with the engineer, he stated had he had known he was pulling 31 cars instead of 23, as he was told, he would have never made the reverse move unless the air was hooked up. Despite this, he was still found at fault by the company and was given a six month suspension. The other trying to use him as a scapegoat. Similar punishment. However, loads of people did not approve of Engineer McDonald's suspension. Now, here's where it gets interesting. 
organizations such as the Brotherhood of Locomotive Love Engineers these guys. Argued the bulletin to have the air brakes hooked up on switching maneuvers. Their leaders at all times. cut out for the uh, strike, but these the guys action. really do have still on the same day. Uh, our backs. It should also be noted that CN and the Canadian Transport Committee were both aware of the practices, but did not act upon them until after the accident. Plus, them not enforcing it earlier to prevent such a runaway would actually make the company itself at fault. They also argued the engineer had over 42 years of service with Canadian National and that he stayed on board the Just dropping in to say happy 10 years, man. Yeah, thank you, I Love Trains 323. I gotta get your lines for uh, Bolstrode done at some point, so, uh, yeah. I'll have to do that later this week. I almost completely forgot. opposed the suspension of the engineer, stating, how could CM be so crass as to suggest his guilt? <laughs> his life to stay with Terrible the attempt at a Canadian the accent. Other factors include the brakes on the locomotive. Now this I can testify to. I've worked with these brake shoes at uh, New Hope and Corbettdale. Composite shoes are which were pain in the ass. Also, because the locomotives were they crack easily. Design, they wear. Uh, they they're, they're cheap. Brakes. Metal composite shoes are way better. Brakes they likely would have been able to hold on to that grade. Nine months later, Hope you get a kid, Thunderbolt. Finally cleared of any fault for the accident. <laughs> Bit of an he odd had compliment, but and thank you, I guess. Allowing him to peacefully retire not long after on November 1st, 1988. He says there was an unused line I had in the uh, audio recording where the engineer, yes, uh, Wesley McDonald, said, Once they get me out of this, they can put me on the effing pension. F uh, the F word being, you know what. But it was just, I couldn't help but laugh. That was probably my favorite part of the recording, but I couldn't find a place for it in the video. Just one year earlier, when a CN manifest with an incapacitated crew slammed head on into a via rail passenger train. It's strange how Hinton was so, uh, hot water. It's strange how the Hinton incident was very reminiscent in this accident, too. Terrifying 20 minutes of his life on that runaway. He has sadly since passed away in 1997. As for the locomotives, may you rest in peace, Wesley. Repaired and returned to service with CN. 9548 would be sold to the Yadkin Valley Railroad in North Carolina sometime in 2004 until being sold again in 2009 to Knoxville Locomotive Works. Today, the engine is now part of the Lancaster and Chester Railroad of South Carolina. 9457 was sold to Railcar Limited in 2005. Where that sound effect come from? Sold again it was a bunk there when I said that. New England Central, renumbered to 3015. And is still in service as of today. Must have been something Runs falling over in near my computer. I don't remember though. After suffering a series of economic ups and downs. Oh, he, you, your dad knew that guy when he was signal maintainer. And huh. the memories of this wow, small world. This is also one of the two engines involved in that accident uh, getting repaired. It looks like it's 9457. Yeah, it is. Look at the bell missing in the one horn. All right, so I know it's all, it's past midnight, but we're going to watch one more video. I wanted to watch this because it's probably the most relevant documentary I have, but it's more than an hour, almost an hour. So instead, we're going to watch, uh, we're going to watch and react to the Chase Maryland one since we watched the original. That way we can compare the two. No, I'll be making more remasters in the future. On January 4th, 1987. And before you ask, I uh, had a bit of a stuffy nose when I was uh, in a small town of Chase, recording Maryland this video on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. Season on RG sucks. of the small Baltimore suburb were always accustomed to hearing until the atmosphere is a lot more dark in this video. Miles an hour, but none of them could ever imagine such a tragedy would occur here in their own backyards. The Northeast Corridor, built by the Pennsylvania Railroad and currently owned by Amtrak, is known to be 16 reasons never to do drugs on the job. The world. Amen. Amtrak trains fly up and down from city to city at speeds of 125 miles an hour 
However, the Amtrak train. I actually also corrected the, track the uh, lean freight train in this you same clip. Between 40 I'm going to pause it right here. You probably noticed there was a significant lean in the uh, original version of the Chase Maryland wreck. Thanks to Adobe, I zoomed it in a little bit and actually straightened the clip. So it actually looks a lot more better now, funny enough. You would never be able to do that in the movie in 60 maker. miles an hour. Slower commuter trains also share these tracks too. Except, uh, should have used the Mark train, but oh well. Via signals and radios, but it depends on everyone following the operating rules. Should have used the Mark train day, for this clip, but... Until 1993, <laughs> oh well. would be the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history. Bit of a longer intro, but it was a lot more in detail, you'll notice, compared to the original. On the morning of January 4th... Foot simulation footage provided by Amtrak Automatic. Thank you so much. Colonial was traveling north from Washington's Union Station to Boston South Station. Originally, I asked for 16 coaches, but I realized it was actually 12 coaches. I think I said 16 in the original video, which was where I got the inaccuracy, so we had to redo all the simulation footage from scratch after that new electromotive division aem7 locomotive nowadays they do fit max back then with not really in the it was pretty inaccurate and back in then 79 and 900 was the prototype for the aem7 I still forget where i got this photo though 900 on the miles main line with both panographs up place the aging former pennsylvania railroad gg1 fleet that have served since 1934. The two locomotives had 11 Amfleet 1s in tow, two of them being snack bar cars. There was also an older Heritage coach, second to last in the Consys, number 7624. This is why 94 was limited to 105 miles an hour. It was that Heritage coach. There was not a speed restriction for the tracks for the that limited them to 105. Ready for the second semester in school. 35-year-old Jerome Evans was the engineer that day. Why are we going to make it a remaster at some point? The original one's PM. not that great. Meanwhile, at Conrail's Bay more detail. Yard, just east of Baltimore, Conrail ENS-121 was preparing to I leave got the symbol this just time. locomotives and no freight cars to a NOLA yard in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The locomotives were three rather new General Electric B36-7 diesels delivered to Conrail See, I made the same mistake. With B36-7s. 30, I should have said B36-7, like everybody else. In the rear. 32-year-old Ricky Lynn Gates was the engineer, and 33-year-old Edward Butch Cromwell was the brake. Yep, man. that is indeed Butch. The train leaves Bayview Yard at 1.16 p.m. Con Rail, Con Air. All we need is Con C, Station, and we'll have all three elements. Or Con Road. At this point, switch Most rail orders don't use the dash. Is that true? Was set to normal, huh. and track two was all lined up guessed? for Amtrak 94 to speed through. So the Con Rail set would have to hold until the Amtrak train had passed before they could know that, the Jessica. Corridor. Thanks. However, Guess it wasn't that bad. This wouldn't be the case. Conrail ENS-121 was approaching Wayside Signal H16-1 at over 60 miles an hour, which was at approach, meaning ENS-121. I got these photos of the signal aspects from this website that actually tests you to stop on signal, signal aspects, which would be a and stop signal. they're probably the cleanest However, uh, photos of signal aspects I've ever seen, so I use them in a lot of my videos signal, now. Still going 60 miles an hour. I got a pretty perfect. I got a pretty good score. I got like eighty-five per, I got like eighty-five, ninety percent on that quiz. Displayed a restricting aspect. Warning to crew to slow down to 15 miles an hour and be prepared to stop. But again, they didn't slow down. An alerter whistle should have sounded warning the crew about this. I think that's what it would have sounded like. With a piece of adhesive. <coughs> yeah, Brakeman Cromwell was also supposed to call out the signals if Gates missed them, but he didn't. Finally, the engineer notices the final signal, one north. Which showed a stop aspect. And Gates Such set the brakes great for editing. Stop. I'm not even being sarcastic. But because of their speed, 
failed. Bit of an inaccuracy here. Um, it wasn't a crossover. It was more or less this track ended right here, and there was another crossover behind them. Um, that was a slight error in the simulation, but it was already too late to fix it. We shot the signal, and the three engines forced their way through the switch. And also, another side note, these reskinned B36-7s were from uh, Automatic as well. So he not only made the simulation for me, he also reskinned these NS B36-7s to be Conrailized. So thank you so much. And slipped onto the main line onto track two. The same track, Amtrak 94. Anonymous, Axel, down. knock it off. Last warning. Jerome Everins rounded a blind corner, traveling at over 125 miles an hour, and spots the Conroe locomotive sitting in his path. He immediately dump the air, dump brakes, the air. But it was already too late. The buildup is so good. Ooh. Bit of a fun fact, uh, we had to make this crash simulation twice because the first time the Conrail uh, engines appeared to literally fly. Like, instead of being bumped like that, you know, like this, it was more like, <laughs> so I'm not sure what he did in order to uh, make them not jump as much from the impact. But uh, yeah, the second time around, it managed to look a lot more realistic. And another weird thing is the physics of the accident were very eerily similar to what exact oh to what uh, the, the cars derailed almost in the exact same pattern they did in uh as they did in real life uh i'll show you an example later actually no i don't think i'll have time but we'll see What are you waiting for, Big John? What's coming through Pitscataway? Amtrak 94 slams into the rear of Conrail ENS 121 at over 120 miles an hour. The force of the impact causes the rear Conrail locomotive 5045 to explode when the kinetic energy passes clean through the empty cab and into the prime mover, knocking it off its mounting. Notice and the shadow. It, That's like a throwing glitch a in the into a simulator. CRT TV screen. The explosion destroys the train cab of AM7903 and tosses the remains and know. the rear cab to the west side of the tracks, instantly killing the engineer, Jerome Evans. It's been said his decapitated head was found several feet from the impact site. Some people got mad at me for pointing that out, but I'm not 100% sure if that fact was true, but I felt like mentioning it anyway. It's also been said Jer uh, Jerome Evans and Ricky Lynn Gates knew each other, which I don't know how spot. I would feel if I, the second Amtrak real, if I found out one of the friends by the that I, that, that was up, like, my, up the, basically, I, I, I would, I'd feel pretty bad. Was like 300 tons of TNT Who am I kidding? I'd feel terrible if I freaking, an accident that I probably caused killed a friend that I knew. At first reporting an explosion, but later reporting the actual train. This is actually true. This was said Most in interviews in the Rescue 911 the worst, episode, and which is the footage out, you're seeing right now. Fears were justified. Locals living nearby came to help the injured, with many of them aimlessly wandering like zombies, begging for help with severe injuries. Inside the mangled cars, luggage had fallen. XL, my real name's victims, not that big of a secret anymore. From their frames, crushing people. And even worse, inside the snack bar cars, the microwaves had flown from the snack bars and wedged themselves into the walkways, jamming exits. Suddenly there was a big jolt. Next Actual was interviews with the passengers. The it was just people flying so much of this was missing in the original. Total mess. There was people like yelling, you know, like, help me, help me, like that. So I, you know, ran up to the train. I crawled through the window. 
And that's when I seen Jim Howard and Catherine Howard. He was, because he his, must have hit his face against the seat and his eye was all swelled and everything like that. And she was pretty bad. She couldn't get up at all or anything like that. So we grabbed her and we handed her out the window. Then we helped him out the window. See, everybody says don't move people to the accident, but then you, you know, that diesel fuel and the fire. Yeah, and that is true. Or not or anything. So if you don't think about it, you say, you know, let's get the people off the train. Yeah, that's Within true. Minutes, He's got a good point there. Especially trained for on that guy's got a really good point there. Race to the scene. And we're quickly overwhelmed. You normally don't want to move people in an accident because you could injure them more. Beg but to you don't know lives, with a situation like that if a fire is going to spread or not. So you just want to get them out as fast as possible. Tools, such as the jaws of life used in automobile accidents were simply useless against the mangled train cars. Even though I tried to make the di uh, the remaster a lot better than the original, I did want to include some elements that they could ladders, hone back to the original in a way, like similar the best narration, could, stuff like that, similar music, right. at least at the end. Some rescuers saw people take their last breaths right in front of them. Thought it'd be pretty tasteful. Rescuers worked all What if it was E60s on the Amtrak instead of AM7s? Until the last oh, jeez, I don't even want to picture that. The E60s were huge and heavier. 16 people lost they their probably would have... And 170 mm. were injured. I don't know if including they... Including the Conrail brakeman... I'm actually Edward not sure Trump, what happened. Who suffered a broken I don't leg. think it'd be that different. The engineers E60s only had a top injured. speed of 80 what miles an hour. As far as, uh, or 90, but yeah. People, the injured and those coming out of the homes around here to help. Uh, yeah, that was it. There, there was people pouring out of their houses. Uh, I was looking at the records immediately. It was, well, I thought it was just assisting passengers and whoever I could. Many of them were, uh, they were walking off the train. They, they seemed dazed or in shock. Uh, there, there were many more injured uh, that were stuck in the trains. They weren't as, as quite as visible because they were still inside. What was going through your mind? I kind of sympathized with him a little with the sights he was seeing until later into the interview where he started just denying all the blame. And I was like, How big and how douche. bad it was and the, the amount of injuries and, and the whole situation. Though, you know. The NTSB immediately Jeez, look at those cat an investigation into the cause of the collision. Like and what looked like it even killed the circuit to the signals, and too. infuriating. Blood and urine tests showed that Gates and Cromwell were both smoking marijuana, and it was found that they had been passing a joint back and forth in the cab of 5044. However, both denied it at first. After we left the yard, when we were on Amtrak's main line, heading up to this point, uh, we, I took about three hits off. We were passing it back and forth. Were you a regular smoker of marijuana, something you'd used before? Uh, yes, I had used it before. Uh, I suppose I would call myself a regular user. In terms of uh, missing the warning lights, missing the pre-alerts, do you think marijuana had any effect on you? No. Lying bastard. People tend to think marijuana has Sorry, that still no pisses me off every time I watch that interview. At Bayview Yard that day Just non like, you didn't notice anything no. off about Gates and Cromwell. However, it can alter one's sense of time and impair the ability to perform tasks that require concentration. Hence why Gates missed several signals warning him not to switch to another set of photo, tracks. This photo was taken. Marijuana also produces very little visual signs compared to people who drink Nowadays you can be drunk and still keep your so job. It's often hard to tell That's true. if somebody abuses Sadly. marijuana or not. Gates even claimed he had a medium approach signal, which would indicate he'd have to slow down to about 30 miles an hour and cross over a set of tracks. But tests of the signals indicated that couldn't be true. It was also revealed not only were the Conrail crew speeding, but the Amtrak train was too. Velocity Runaway Trains touched on this, but they got, since they wanted to make trains look dangerous, I feel like, in that video, and unsafe, they listed the train, uh, the Amtrak train, going 128 miles an hour, which I eventually found out was completely bogus. The I don't know where the hell they got that info, because I looked around... Was about Nothing said anything miles about an hour, 120 and miles an hour. At 110 miles an hour. A speed restriction that was in effect at the time of the accident limited passenger trains to 105 miles an hour. It was only well. because of the uh, heritage Conrail car and the consist. 121 was going 60 miles an hour before its emergency brake application, and Amtrak 94 was going 125 miles an hour. 
However, even if the Amtrak train was not speeding, going at this either is very true. or 110 miles an hour, it would have made very little difference and would still have no hope of stopping in time when Jerome spotted the Conrail units. Toxicology tests also came back negative in Jerome's body. It was also discovered that the Conrail crew did not do their pre-departure tests before leaving Bayview Yard, and as a result, several errors were found in the lead locomotive 5044. The Pennsylvania Railroad-style cab signals had the approach bulb missing, and the little whistle that would alert the crew that they had passed a signal other than clear was silenced with adhesive tape. The biggest single, uh, I guess, technical problem would have been the whistle being taped over. The alert whistle taped over. Right. Gates claimed he didn't know where it was, and he also said he didn't mute the whistle himself. I wouldn't, I don't think he muted it himself, but he should have looked for that whistle. However, whether that was true make sure or not, it was, working. it was his job to not only look for it, but to also remedy it and the other issues. That's right. To make matters worse, the radio in 5044 was non-functional, so they had to borrow the radio from 5045 and put it in 5044. But the crew stated they had a lot of difficulty hooking it up, so it was mostly non-functional. Which is a safety hazard. The same issue was also present in the Amtrak engines, as 903 did not have an operable radio in either end. Mm, so the Amtrak it lasted a good 10 more years after this incident. If that wasn't enough, Gates also apparently had quite the bad driving record. But it was not a, a good state, uh, not a good look for Conrail, since they quick, but since they the became accident. a private company not long before As after this incident. As a result of the NTSB's findings, Conrail immediately suspended both Gates and Cromwell, but both resigned instead of facing certain termination of employment. Gates was later charged with manslaughter by locomotive. What an odd after charge! Guilty, <laughs> he was sentenced. I think he's to the only guy I know of. Prison. I think he's the only guy in history to be charged with such a crime. Investigators, but he instead served five years in a Maryland prison. Because I was the engineer of the Conrail engines 5044, I am ultimately responsible not only for my own negligence, but also for the conduct of the Wait, how did he get a job of a Conrail? Probably, yeah, uh, just, just like how anybody else would get a job Under on the Maryland railroad law, back in the day. Locomotive is considered as a motored vehicle and was one of the first convictions of a locomotive Besides, he probably hit his uh, smoking habit anyway. In history. And that dri driving conviction was probably before after he served his time, applied he worked to, as a was probably after he applied, he became an uh, uh, crewman on Conrail. The dangers of drugs and alcohol to people like high school students. I loved this video clip. This was really, really nice to add in. Because I think it brings a little humility to Gates. Because, yeah, he screwed up big time. But at least in this video, you can tell he's sorry. Like, he, you know, he knows, like, hey, I screwed up. I know I'm probably going to be the scapegoat since everybody else did it. But, yeah. As I said on January 16th, 1988, I have relived the events of January 4th, 1987 over and over again in my mind and the pain never goes away i cannot begin to imagine the pain and the grief i have caused those touched by the accident i am sorry i hope my testimony can aid this committee i believe that random drug and alcohol testing is the appropriate response to an industry-wide problem my experience has led me to believe that testing based upon reasonable suspicion standard is not effective I say this because I believe that standard provides little, if any, guidance. Ah, shoot. I didn't mean to press rail. that button. Sorry, Other Texas words, Hot Rail. Inherent in this standard means there is little uniformity in its application. Presently, according to a form post at cstrains.com, he now works as an operating engineer running heavy equipment. He still misses the railroad and still loves This trains, was a very interesting find he's quite when really I was researching for the remaster. Actions. After the accident, federal legislation now requires random drug and alcohol tests on safety-related positions. This includes locomotive engineers. Also, as a direct result of the collision, federal legislation was enacted that required the FRA to develop a system of federal certification for locomotive engineers. These regulations went into effect in January of 1990, and ever since then, 
Railroads are required by law to certify that engineers are properly trained and qualified and that they have no drug or alcohol impairment motor vehicle convictions for the five-year period prior to certification. The kind of amazing I found that as well because some people were like, there's no way you're the real Gates, but he quickly proved that to those kids he was real. Like marijuana and alcohol not to mention be more stricter on pre-departure checks. Just so more strict, like not stricter. For the cab Come signals on. can be spotted and rectified, as well as taped alerter whistles. An inspection of local... Likely he is still alive, Gulf Breeze, but since he's in his 60s by now, whistles. I imagine he's probably living the retired life. Was you know, where you just sit at home. home. The Pennsylvania Railroad style just relaxing. always had one color for all <sighs> aspects. That felt Amber. good. This accident would eventually lead Amtrak to replace them with color-coded position signals now found all across the Northeast Corridor, with the only known exception being on the Keystone Corridor between Paoli and Philadelphia. Hey, my buddy Eddie, EMDSC-14R. Shout out to him. The accident led to all locomotives operating on the Northeast Corridor to be required to have automatic cab signaling with an automatic train stop feature. Although common on passenger trains up until that point, cab signals combined with a train stop and speed control had never been installed on freight locomotives due to the potential train handling Thank you for the donation, HR 126. Conrail Thank you. I know I did a good job on this remaster. A locomotive speed limiter, S still to this LSA, day my favorite video I ever made. device that is designed to monitor and control the right of deceleration for restrictive signals in conjunction with the cab signals. All freight locomotives which operate on the Northeast Corridor must now be equipped with an operating LSL, which also limits top speeds to 50 miles an hour. Previously, freight locomotives were only required to just have cab signals, but not an automatic train stop feature. Interesting. This system also paved the way for automatic braking systems, such as positive train control. Again, I'm not too sure, but, lines, you know, you could make the, the argument. Corridor. As for the locomotives and equipment, 5045 was totally destroyed and was never rebuilt. The only way they Both found out 5045 was there was because there was a little bit, the a piece of a cab that's just said 45 on the side of it. That's, a, that's how you knew. That's the only way you knew. Was eventually repaired there was not much left. Shops in Altoona, Pennsylvania and returned to service, as was 5044, which had minor No damage. bloopers at the end of this video, when but Conrail I will upload them uh, in another video in June one day. Of 1999, 5052 was sold to CSX and renumbered to 5805, still retaining its Conrail livery until being sold in the early 2000s to Estrada de Ferro Victoria Minas, a railroad in Brazil, where it was regaged to I could have batched the two up to save running time. And that's, one, that's one thing I wish I did for this video. -7, number 744. It was last photographed in 2006 and is likely still in service. 5044 was also given to CSX, renumbered as 5801, also keeping its Conrail livery until being sold to Estrada de Ferro Victoria Minas, regaged and renumbered to 740. South American, be that's right. To Valor da Logistica Integra da, being repainted, but still keeping its also own number Also, Well, yeah, because they're ex-Pennsylvania Railroad Lines, Caleb Trains, that's why. Ten years after the accident, the McDonough School of Owings Mills, Maryland, decided to build a 448-seat theater in memory of one of the crash victims, 16-year-old Cerise Millicent Horn, who was on board at the time. But didn't laugh. She was I don't know, it was painted in YN2 at one point. Roger Interesting. And Susan Horn. She graduated that explains why it was in EFV, uh, in Estralcio v. Victoria Minas's uh, livery at one point. Accident. On January 4th, 2007, 20 years after the crash, her family it is interesting, but it is true, Derek. I'm not really a that big of an endorser for PTC in anymore. Uh -uh. The Baltimore County Fire Department's medical commander at the scene 20 years Notice how this track the was used in the original version, and I even used it in the remaster. That was another reference to the original video. 
He said on quote, the reason is how the members of the professional and volunteer fire departments and the community people got together. It was, he said, a very sad but very proud moment in his career. The accident would remain the deadliest and the worst in Amtrak's history until 1993, when its death toll was surpassed by the Big Bayou incident when Amtrak's Sunset Limited hit a damaged bridge at 70 miles an hour and plunged into the Mobile River in Alabama. That wreck killed 47 and injured 103. One of the worst rail disasters in American history, Chase, Maryland will certainly never be forgotten. On the 30th anniversary of the collision, yours truly made a documentary. See, there's the lean I was talking about. That same video not only led to several more being produced on other accidents, but this yep, remastered. 50 videos. Well. It has been 35 years now since this tragedy. And while some mental scars shared with victims, families, and rescuers alike will never fully heal, the fact is I being a set for bonnet 470 s 470 4706 productions <laughs> something we can all be grateful for okay. No, you're not safer in a plane, believe me. At least when a train derails, you have a good chance of surviving, while uh, when a plane starts nose diving, you might as well kiss your butt goodbye before you die a friggin' uh, big fire. Now, before we go, since I said this was going to be the last video I was going to react to, there is something I, I mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the, when I was reacting to this about how the crash physics were eerily the same going the second way around. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, where's the stream thing? There it is. Woo! <laughs> I'm gonna put the image up real quick, um, and I'll show you what I was talking about earlier about the uh, crash physics being very eerily similar. Um, I think I have it in one of my, uh, where is it? Hold on. Just uh, bear with me for a minute. It'll be like a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a behind the scenes clip since, you know, you guys, some, uh, over 60 of you guys stuck around for almost the entire stream. Thank you so much for that. Um, you're going to get yourself a bit of a bonus. Uh, I just got to find it in my video manager. Um, let's see. Collision redone. I think this is the video. All right. I think I found it. So, um, yeah, I'll show you what I mean by the crash physics were very, very eerily similar. I'll just skip to the impacts, uh, scene. This was, I uploaded the clip as an unlisted video so I could download it easier since I was having issues importing it into Adobe. Oh, this clip doesn't have it. Whoopsies. Hold on. Uh, let me go back. Um, 12 car fix. Here we go. This must be it. Oh, wait. No, never mind. Jeez, which one was it then? Uh, hold on. Here we go. This was the clip. This was when we used 16 cars, not 12, uh, not 12, like in reality. So yeah, this is more about, this is behind the scenes right here. This was the original clips from Automatic. You can see, uh, he originally used eight EM7s that had the ditch lights and the Amtrak logo in the middle. I happened to find some uh, AEM-7 models that didn't have the ditch lights there. They still had the numbers on the side, but they didn't have the ditch lights, making the simulation a little bit more accurate. So I supplied those to him, and he was like, thank you, this is great. So, uh, yeah, you can see a little bit too many cars. <laughs> Going a lot slower in this clip, too. Um... 
yeah, going all the way to the end of the video, you'll see, you'll also see the bad crash physics as well, I think. I think this clip had it as well. Yep. You could see the Conrail units literally jumped in the air, which was a major inaccuracy when putting the video together. If I can find the clip again, I'll just go back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah, the impact was way too strong in this first draft. But then, as we go to the, uh, there's this extra scene, of course. Because the 5044 did roll a little bit before coming to a stop after separating from 5052. And then, there's the aftermath. You can see it's very eerily similar. There was another clip, too, that showed it as well. I think, I don't remember. The only difference is this, uh, the Yam fleet would have been a little more to the side here, but yeah, it was kind of interesting. So yeah, um, a little bit of a uh, watching, uh, it's still amazing, you know, how we've been doing this for over 10 years, or I've been doing this for 10 years. Some people think there's a literal editing team behind the scenes. I'm a liter this is literally a one man show. I'll sometimes get people to help out for like simulations or extra voices. But when it comes to editing, it is all me. A lot of people seem to forget that. that I even got a call from a TV producer in uh, Canada who was doing a video on Lac Magantic and was asking permission for the footage of Wyawiga. And she was expecting like an editor or something to be on the line, but she didn't realize it was a one-man guy putting all this together. She's like, wow, is this for real? And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, it is well past everybody's bedtime. It's freaking 12.45 over here. I've been doing the stream for way too long. But just thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a glimpse back to the past on what the channel was like back in the day. Um, one more super chat, though, from for those who like trains. Thanks for the two bucks. Great stream. Congrats on 10 years and one day. <laughs> you had to add in the one day bit, didn't you? But, um... Yeah, it's been quite an incredible journey. Uh, thank you so much for you got uh, all you guys, all sixty of you guys sticking around. I was expecting the viewer numbers to go down to at least like thirty or something, but you guys are have been loyal the whole time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sticking around with me for ten years. Uh, it really means a lot to me. A lot more coming uh, into the future with the channel and stuff like that. Hope to see uh, see all you guys in the future, and take care. Good night, everybody.